Welcome to San Francisco on a perfect night for baseball night in America. It's Dodgers and Giants second game in this three game series after the Dodgers took the opener 3 2 last night and we say welcome inside CJ Nikowski. I'm Joe Davis. This is one of the game's great rivalries and here we are once again. We're in mid June and these are the top two teams in the division 2016 turning out to be a fun year right now in the National League West the Giants and the Dodgers probably the two teams that are going to be there at the very end. The weird thing is though neither one of them has hit they've been winning games despite the offense is not being very good in the case of the Dodgers the bright spots have been the young guys Corey Seager and Trace Thompson have been splendid. We're talking about the team with the highest payroll in Major League Baseball and they're relying on two guys that are making close to the league minimum to help produce on the offensive side. You mentioned Corey Seager at 22 years old right now a favorite for rookie of the year but how about Trace Thompson taking advantage of an opportunity with Yasiel Puig and Andre Ethier being out. He has been fantastic for this club. And how about the Giants? This team starting in early May went on a run that was by far the best in the National League. But again, it's with an offense that is below average. Their bright spot has been their first baseman, Brandon Belt. And Brandon Belt right now at 28 years old, really coming into his own. The San Francisco Giants give him a six year contract at the beginning of the year, and it is paying off. And the difference has been he is striking out less, he is walking more. He has been an on base machine, a very much needed one in this San Francisco Giants lineup. And he and the Giants will face off with Scott Casimir of the Dodgers. Jeff Samarja takes it for the Giants. A couple of guys in their first years with these teams and in their first years in this rivalry one of the best in baseball it's the Dodgers and Giants first pitch on baseball night at America on the other side of this break. Utley set to lead things off his first year as a full-time leadoff hitter in his long career. 
And it's Corey Seager having a great season, perhaps the leader right now for Rookie of the Year in the National League. Turner and Gonzalez, three and four, then Thompson, Peterson, Grandall, and Kendrick, and the pitcher, Kazmir, hitting nine. They face off with a 31-year-old from Indiana, Jeff Samarja, who's in his first season with the Giants after signing that five-year deal this offseason. And we take a look at our Lowe's pitcher profile. And thinking about Jeff Samarj, one thing he wants to do today is set the bait, try to get these Dodgers hitters to chase his good stuff out of the zone and home cooking. He has been very good at AT&T Park over the course of his career. Certainly happy for him, I'm sure, that he's pitching at home today. And happy to be at least away from St. Louis, where in his last start he gave up four home runs over a nine batters stretch. Chase Utley stands in and looks at strike one. Really good numbers in his career against Samarja. 389. He's homered. He's tripled. And he has three doubles. Nothing and two. A good way to get things started here for Jeff Samarja. You see him working the outside part of the plate. To Chase Utley, they don't shift very heavily against him. If you're going to pitch a guy away, especially a left-handed hitter, you do not play the shift. We see that a lot going on right now in Major League Baseball. So one ball and two strikes on Chase Utley. Top of this Dodgers lineup. On one two. Buster Posey I think he thought that was going to bounce fair as you saw him come out of his crotch as quickly as possible. The ball had a little bit of backspin or caught him behind home plate but Buster Posey one of the better defenders behind the plate. To watch this ball go straight down and hit the plate. So Posey jumps up but actually it's a very unusual backspin that's not something you see every day. Oh. With what we saw in the first inning last night, the series opener, <laughs> not going to be surprised with anything. And Johnny Cueto's first half inning. So he gave up, I think he hit Chase Utley. Then Corey Seeger gets an infield single. Then a wild pitch moves the runners up to second and third. And then they call a balk on Cueto that brings in the first run. And not just a balk, but an unusual one with Johnny Cueto pitching from the windup. And doing something that he always does, which is the Johnny Cueto, Cueto I mean, you call him shimmer and shakes, and trying to throw the timing off of a hitter. They called him out on it last night. He calls it the rocking chair. Here it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's Bill Welke was the first base umpire that called this a ball. I mean, it's an unusual move, and sometimes people think it's nonsense, but the idea behind it is, again, to disrupt the timing of the hitter. That is what pitching is all about. I think this umpiring crew was looking for that, for them to make that call, especially from the first base side. Really didn't make a lot of sense, but the message has been sent that with runners on base, it was not going to be allowed. Now Chase Otley has worked this into an eight pitch at bat to start the game for the Dodgers. With Seager and Turner to follow. On two and two, Chase Otley foul tips it into the mid for strike three. And so Samarja wins this battle for the first out of the game. Part of the reason the Giants were counting on a bounce back from Samarja coming over from the White Sox is that they knew he was going from one of the worst defenses in baseball to one of the best. Now that'll be a difference maker for any pitcher but also the environment here knowing that this team is going to catch the ball gives you all the confidence in the world to fill up the strike zone pitch to contact Jeff Samarja has done that this year and he's taken full advantage of this great giant defense. And misses with ball one to Corey Seager. Having a great rookie season. Was called up early September last year. And by the time the postseason hit, he was the team's three hitter already. In his first opening day roster this year. And over the last month, regardless of rookie or second year or veteran or whatever it is, he's been one of the best hitters, bottom line, in baseball. Two and one. You'd never guess he's as young as he is. And you see a guy who was comfortable right from the beginning 
He's got that body language. I'm sure there was nerves at the beginning when he got called up last year, but he never showed it on the outside. His game never showed it. We always talk about young players getting comfortable at the big league level, and it just feels like Corey Seager has been comfortable since the first day he put on that Dodger uniform. Pulls one to second. Joe Panic, two up, two down. Well, Jeff Samarja, who had that rotten season last year with an ERA around five, one of the big problems was the first inning. He had an ERA above eight in the first inning last year. So far this year, he's given up just one first inning run. And that's not an uncommon problem among, amongst pitchers. You see it a lot, even good ones. Tom Glavin, one of the greats, a Hall of Famer, had some issues in the first inning, and it's a matter of getting comfortable. And guys try different ways to attack that and try to get that fixed. Does it mean more throwing in the bullpen? Does it mean starting your routine a little bit earlier? Guys will try a bunch of different things to get there. And it seems like whatever it was for Jeff Samarja from last year compared to this year, Dave Rigetti has helped him find a way to conquer that problem. Pours in strike one to Justin Turner, last night's hero for the Dodgers. And in that ninth inning home run against Santiago Casilla to win it 3-2. Came up in a 2-2 game and just barely got it out of here to left field. Well, there is no such thing as a cheap home run in San Francisco, even though that one barely got over the wall. And in such a huge situation, Justin Turner doesn't care if it just made it or whether or not he hit that Coke bottle out in left field. It all counts for one run, and that was a big run at that moment. And to help Clayton Kershaw's outing be a win, Kershaw had gone eight innings, had struck out 13, but was looking at a no decision. Had Turner not hit that ball out. Here's the one two to Turner. And he goes the other way with a line drive base hit. Blanco to cut it off. Turner on his way to second and he's got a two out double. Well, Justin Turner, as we know, has struggled a little bit this year. He's not been the same guy he has been the last couple of years, but maybe that home run last night gets him started. Here's a fastball up and away, and instead of trying to do too much, he, he takes what Jeff Samarja gave him, which is a ball away, and drives it away, and could have been very dangerous as it goes toward Triple's alley, but a nice job by Williamson knocking, excuse me, cutting that ball off. Otherwise, that's big trouble if it goes all the way to the wall. And it keeps the frame alive for Adrian Gonzalez, who had an RBI single in the first inning against Cueto last night. And it takes ball one. Dodger first baseman hitting 280. Although in this month of June, just four of 27. Left it over the plate, and it's fouled off one and one. And we've seen the plan so far here for Jeff Samarja early in the inning, working these left handed hitters away. He ultimately got Corey Seager on a good, strong cutter in. We always go through this the first inning where hitters will take a look at what do they have. They start to share it with each other. And the word right now for these Dodgers hitters is that Samarja is going to try to get ahead of you, working that fastball away. This is 1 1 to Gonzalez. This is up two balls and a strike. It's his second start against the Dodgers this season back on April 17th at Dodger Stadium. Gave up three runs over six innings and a loss. Turner at second with two gone. And a two on to Adrian Gonzalez. And that's something that's a little bit different about Jeff Samarja as well as he gets a little bit older. The stuff is still there. That's a fastball count to a good fastball hitter, even though Adrian Gonzalez is struggling here a little bit. And what does he throw? A cutter in that situation. Something a little bit off speed to get Agon off the fastball. Well executed right there. Jeff Samarja throws that cutter as much as anybody in the big leagues. Only Josh Tomlin among starting pitchers uses it more. Yeah, about a third of the pitches that Samarja throws are cutters. His 2-2. Got into the hands, bounced into a shifted panic, playing in short right to finish this first inning. Dodgers waste a two out double, and the Giants come to bat when you come back.
Jack Kazmir. This lineup trying to get things kicked into gear, hitting below 200 over their last 10 games. Denard Span walks up there, ready to lead it off. They're glad to have Posey back in the equation after a few days off with a sore thumb. And some unfamiliar names down to the bottom, like Mac Williamson, filling spots opened up because of key injuries to guys like Pagan and Pence. 32-year-old Scott Kazmir ready to face off with his Giants lineup. His 13th start of the season. His third one against San Francisco. Strike one. Now Kazmir over his first nine starts, the ERA was above five, but over his last three starts, he's been really good. The key's been keeping the ball in the yard after he gave up 12 home runs in his first nine outings. Bouncing ball, Gonzalez at first, feeding Kazmir for out number one. We take a look at our Lowe's pitcher profile for Scott Kazmir. What are you watching for, A couple of things here, Joe. We've got to rinse and repeat. And what does that mean? Scott Kazmir does such a great job of repeating his delivery when he is there. He is most consistent. And how about quattro quadrants? Not easy to say as we get a little punny here on uh, baseball night in America. But what that means is Scott Kazmir does a really good job of pitching to all four quadrants. Dave Roberts likes when he does that, says he's at his best when he does that. Up and in, down and in, up and away, down and away. Hitting all of those spots, elevating when he can, setting that up has been a key to his success, especially during this recent good run. Joe Panic. How long do you spend coming up with those? You Not sit that, around. It wasn't terrible. I'm going to tell you something, though. As I was reading, I'm like, you know what? Maybe I should come up with things that are easier to read <laughs> as opposed <laughs> yeah. to quattro quadras. But I just don't want to give you he's good up in the zone. Oh. I have a little fun with it, get a little punny if we can. Yeah. No one from Scott Kazmir. Hit on the ground is second. Chase Utley. A couple of ground ball outs for Kazmir to start the day. Take a look at our keys to the game. They're sponsored by the Lincoln Motor Company. We're well, looking at the Dodgers taking flight. A lot of ground balls out of this offense. Dave Roberts needs to see more line drives, more quality fly balls. And for the San Francisco Giants, we saw it and we're seeing it right now. Let the lefties lead, even though they're going up against that lefty and Scott Casimir, Denard Spann, Joe Panic, and now Brandon Belt. Three lefties to lead off this lineup against the lefties. These guys are the ones that are going to have to get on base. How about Brandon Belt hitting out of the three spot today? It's the second time in the last three games he's done so, but only the second time this year. And so Bruce Bochy flipping he and Matt Duffy in the order, saying it's something he wants to take a bit of a look at. See if it doesn't jolt this struggling offense. And you see this shift on Brandon Belt, lefty on lefty, good chance he's going to try to pull. And you think about now, how do you execute your game plan? It's going to be mostly, I would assume, fastballs. We saw the slider, but fastballs middle in to try to get him to hit that ground ball to the right side. Statcast powered by Amazon Web Services. And the Giants are the least shifted against team in the majors, although Belt is the guy that continues to see the most shifts. On two and one. Three balls and one strike. Talked about him off of the top, but it's been a great season for Belt. Signed that extension during April. And with a totally new approach, he's become one of the top on base percentage players in the National League. As many walks as he has strikeouts this year. And there's another. He now has one more free pass than he does Case. Well, it's amazing to see, and Scott Cashman will be the first one to tell you that that's a frustrating at bat. Two on, excuse me, two outs and nobody on. You certainly do not want to be walking a three hitter, especially when you're going lefty on lefty with Buster Posey coming up. But maybe that's exactly what Bruce Bochy was going for. We know about the walk rate right now with Brandon Belt. The more base runners you put in front of Buster Posey, the more runs you're going to score. And Bruce Bochy was encouraged that Posey bounced back from his first game in close to a week last night. His thumb feeling okay. Well enough to make back to back starts. Hadn't started since last Saturday before his one for four night last night. Tying the game with a double in the sixth inning. One and one lost his bat up into the extended netting <laughs> and it gets lodged there. 
How are we going to get that down, <laughs> CJ? I know I can tell you this. I'm not climbing up there to get it, and that bat is probably going to stay there for a while. <laughs> I don't think we're going to have a game delay. I don't know if they make a ladder that big. And that is amazing. And this was all because of the really good changeup that Scott, Skaz excuse me, Casimir threw. And look at the swing. Buster Posey way out front, can't hold on to his bat. And fortunately, that netting comes out just far enough to catch that thing. It's an impressive toss. And that is new netting this season. Installed at all Major League Baseball parks. To go from the backstop to the home plate side of the dugouts. So we play on with that bat stuck up there. Casimir delivers a 1 1. A little bit low. Two balls, one struck. You know, normally you see stuff get caught in the net in basketball games. And they got to have somebody jump up and knock it out. I don't think that's going to work. I mean, that thing, you it see is. how it's in one side and then comes back out the other. And Marucci certainly happy to get a little extra TV time. But how about if you're sitting underneath that bat right now? Are you expecting it maybe to jump out at any point? Could you sit under that and just watch the game? Or are you constantly <laughs> looking up? Just like you maybe yeah. get a construction helmet and play it safe. She's locked in. And I don't know why she's wearing a Royals shirt. Get some bad directions today. Yeah. You know what it's got to be like? It's got to be like having a conversation with somebody who's got something stuck in their teeth <laughs> or on their shirt lapel. You know, you're trying to focus, but you just can't because the bat's hovering over you. Full count on Posey. Are you suggesting that was me at lunch today? No, no, no. Okay. no. Why did I not look focused? <laughs> Buster Posey was Buster Posey for the first month of the season. As recently as May 5th, the average was at 330, but he's hit below 200 since then. And on this payoff pitch, he takes ball four. So back to back two out walks from Scott Casimir, and they're at first and second for Matt Duffy. As Monty Grandall, part of this Dodger defense, goes out to have a word with Kazmir. This is the number two defense in baseball when it comes to turning batted balls into outs. When you look up the middle, how strong they are, Corey Seager, we talked about. Jock Peterson is a plus defender. Chase Utley has been doing it for years. Agon as well. This is a solid infield. And I think now more than ever, people paying attention to that stat that you're talking about, those batted balls, how often do you turn those into outs? It seems baseball 101, of course, you want to catch the ball when it is hit but the Dodgers have been one of the best as you mentioned in baseball at turning those batted balls into outs. So Matt Duffy with a chance here in the first inning of a scoreless game. And he shoots a line drive to right that'll put San Francisco on the board. Three consecutive two out base runners for the Giants. Duffy with an RBI single and it's one nothing. Well, certainly Bruce Bochy has got to feel good about this lineup. Trying it out with Belt third, Posey fourth, and now Duffy. And you would assume after two two-out walks, would you be taking a pitch trying to work another walk? Absolutely not. For Matt Duffy looking for a first pitch with the runner in scoring position to drive the other way. Hits that line drive down the right field line. Excellent hitting, not waiting around, not getting deep in the count. And right now, all of a sudden, three, four, five here for the San Francisco Giants. Bruce Bochy has to like what he sees. That bat's still up there. <laughs> and the offense keeps going, and they might never want to take it down. Brandon Crawford, him into the corners and two gone. And we talked about Samarja's first inning struggles as a White Sox last year. Had an ERA above eight, has been better in the first inning this year. But the first inning has been a problem for Scott Casimir in 2016 with an ERA around six. Now look at Trace Thompson in right field right now. Even though you have the left-handed hitting Brandon Crawford, what happens in this ballpark so often is that you want to prevent balls getting into that triples alley. And so a lot of right fielders will play way off of the line. But a great opportunity here for Brandon Crawford if he can pull that ball down the line. Easily extra bases in what otherwise may be just a base hit. Just 
Now Kazmir trying to strand runners at the corners. Dangerous pitch here to Crawford on 2 0. Spins it outside. Three balls and no strikes. Kazmir needed only four pitches, CJ, to get the first two outs of the inning, but walk, walk, single, and now he's falling behind Crawford 3 0. And that 2 0 pitch tells me a lot. Because he throws a breaking ball in a 2 0 count with a lefty hitter, tells me that fastball release point right now is not feeling good, and the confidence in that pitch is down a little bit. He's won three consecutive decisions. Beat the Braves on Sunday, gave up three runs over five plus, and left that game having only thrown 85 pitches because of cramping in his left leg. Minor and didn't miss any time. That's a base hit to left. And the Giants with a two run first inning. RBI single Brandon Crawford. Excellent hitting by Brandon Crawford in that situation. Another RBI situation. Another hitter, hitters count at 3 1. But instead of trying to do too much, this ball's right down the middle. But look at the head down as he watches that ball go in the left field. His eyes don't go too, get too big. Does not try to hit the ball out of the ballpark. He wants that RBI. Excellent at bat. For Brandon Crawford, who really over the last couple of years has really kind of jumped on the scene offensively. He's always been a very good shortstop, always been a pretty good hitter. But the last couple of years, things have really taken off for Brandon Crawford. Hey, he led all major league shortstops in RBIs last year, led the Giants in home runs. Won his first silver slugger, was an all star for the first time. And as San Francisco in front, 2 0, four consecutive two out base runners after Kazmir retired the first two men of the inning on four pitches. It's an old adage in baseball two out walks, nobody on, two outs. Go ahead and throw the ball over the middle, let guys put the ball in play, but it's back to back walks to a couple of really good hitters in Brandon Belt and Buster Posey. And both of those walks have now turned in to run scored against Scott Kazmir. Bell brings up Mac Williamson. Who's in his second stint in the majors this year, taking advantage. Some time opened up because of injuries to Pagan and Pence. Attacks the first Ooh. pitch and fouls it back. Strike one. Now the Giants have not hit. They're below league average in runs per game. It's been especially bad lately. 191, the team average over the last 10 games. But part of that has been such important pieces on the shelf. You can really say that and we've talked about it with both of these clubs losing key pieces on both sides and then your depth suddenly gets tested. If you want to be a contender in baseball you have to have depth. You have to have guys on your bench that you know you can plug in. You have to have guys in the minor leagues that can step up when a need arises that has happened for both of these clubs. It is probably the area at least one of the areas that general managers and managers stress out about the most. How deep is your team because you know injuries are going to come. Chase to change one and two. There's there's Hunter Pence. He's going to miss a couple of months after the hamstring surgery. Pagan beginning a rehab this weekend. Here he is coming out of his <laughs> surgery. We tweeted it. I'm okay. Not surprising to see that big smile on his face. Certainly one of the great personalities that this game has to offer, but I'm sure it is killing him right now to watch his team battle without him. Not a scooter, but it gets him from point A to point B. <laughs> Kazmir strikes out Williamson to finish a 25 pitch first inning. That bat's still up there. Wonder if it's ever going to come down. RBI hits from Duffy and Crawford. The Giants up to nothing after one.
This is sponsored by Chevrolet Find New Roads. Giants with two runs in the first inning and a 2 0 lead as we go to the second. Joe Davis and CJ Nikowski at AT&T Park. Trace Thompson set to lead off this inning against Jeff Samarja. Five, six, and seven in the Dodger order. Thompson has gone from being a guy who needed injuries to even make the roster out of spring training to a rotational fill in player to an everyday player to one of the top rookies in the game <laughs> and the very top rookie by many measures. It's been an interesting run for Trace Thompson. He's done a really nice job going back to the offseason. First of all, when he was involved in that three team trade comes over from the White Sox and a lot of people criticized the Dodgers for not taking Todd Frazier in that deal. They thought maybe that would be the smarter move but they wanted the younger players and one of those younger players was Trace Thompson and he has forced his way into this lineup originally once he did make the team it looked like it was going to be a platoon role but he had done so well in his at bats that Dave Roberts had no other choice but to give him some more opportunities. He's taken great advantage of the playing time that he has gotten with the Dodgers. Takes a strike two and two he is the brother of Warriors star Clay Thompson and uh, Clay and the family are here. Of course their father the former Lakers player Michael Thompson you see sitting in the back row. There's Clay in the first row with the Dodger cap on and his bros got a base hit into center to start the second. Is he going to is he going to hear it from Bay Area fans for wearing that Dodger hat or will they understand. I think, I think they'll okay. be OK with it with uh, one more victory on the basketball side. I think they'll be willing to let it go at least in the short term the long term maybe not so much. He's got game five Monday night. As his Warriors try to wrap up his second consecutive NBA title. It's a pretty impressive gene pool they got going over there in that suite. They think about the athletes that have come out of that family. And it's really unbelievable. How cool is that to come and watch? You're playing in the NBA and you get to come to a big league stadium and cheer your, your little brother on. That is uh, really, really cool. Jack Peterson fouls back the first pitch for a strike. And we were talking with Dave Roberts before the game about Trace Thompson and, and he noted the family that he comes from and said yeah that is significant because with it almost comes an expectation that in the biggest moments you will succeed and there's really no other way to look at it. And he used a really interesting phrase too. When we were talking about it. He said he does not have the fear of success and a lot of times you talk about the fear of failure and sports can do that to you. Nobody wants to fail on the big stage but he said Trace Thompson's not afraid to do well and succeed and there takes a certain mentality to be able to do that. Thompson tagging from first on a fly ball to left and he's in safely. The aggressiveness to go along with the athleticism and a man in scoring position with one gone. Well this is a heads up play and watch the slide as well does not leave early but smart enough to watch the throw and slide to the inside part of the bag as the throw went to the outside and get that left foot in there. It's not just that athleticism it's not just instinct but it's also smarts go back to first take a chance at tagging up this is a big ballpark and that ball was hit pretty deep to left field. What a great slide and a smart play to get yourself into scoring position almost good as a sacrifice punt. Mm -hmm. And it looks like they will not challenge this. So Trace Thompson hustles his way into scoring position and sets up a nice opportunity here for Yasmani Grandal. Jeff Samarja comes home with the first one. Grandal takes it upstairs for ball one. Grandal struggling, the average below 200. Average was near 300 in early May, but then when the team was on a road trip in Toronto, suffered a bruised wrist. And the average has dropped significantly since. It was something he dealt with during spring training as well. Forearm problem. Started the season on the DL. And after that good start, he's gone through a rocky last month. Well, certainly, any injury is going to slow you down when you're trying to hit major league pitching, but a wrist, obviously, a big one. Your hands, your wrists, so important when you're trying to drive the baseball. No doubt that has affected Grandal. He didn't like that call, <laughs> and understandably so. That 2 0 fastball appeared to be off the plate, also had some really good run on it. But if you're going to get those kind of calls you might as well go ahead and throw that pitch again because that one is pretty much unhittable. 
See what he does on 2 1. Posey setting out there again, throwing it again, trying to extend that corner. This one's too far out there. 3 and 1. Now this was interesting. We watched kind of the high home here and take a look at where Joe Panic is playing and how deep he is. When you have an athletic runner, good runner at second base right now with Trace Thompson, a ground ball even to Panic's right could score a run here, even if it's not a base hit. If he has to dive to knock that ball down, when you think about how good of a runner he could be, a ground ball could get him in. Grandall singles into center. Thompson headed for the plate. Span throws into second on an RBI single from Yasmani Grandal, and it's a 2-1 game in the second. Well, how about a couple of nice approaches here by both Trace Thompson and Yasmani Grandal trying to keep the ball in the middle of the field. It's a fastball, kind of inner third, ran back a little bit over the middle of the plate after Jeff Samarja tried to go away, away, but fell behind in that 3-1 count, had to come back over. And a very nice job by Grandal to drive that ball up the middle. Yeah, Spotty Grandal, CJ, has faced Samarja four times in his career and not been retired. Three hits and a walk. And that run does not score without the hustle from Trace Thompson. Tagging from first on a fly out to left center. There's ball on Howie Kendrick. And those are the little things that matter when you're trying to win, you're trying to contend in what's going to be a tough division, most likely to come down to both of these teams. Head to head matchups are so important. Those little things, getting that run back on the board, makes a huge difference. Great angle to see that tailing action. Love that view, and you don't get to see it too often. People wonder, you watch a game on TV, especially when we're watching, usually from center field and saying, that pitch looked pretty easy to hit. Then you get that <laughs> view right there, and you realize it's 95 miles an hour with some really, really good life at the end of it. It's 2 all. Kendrick fouls it away, 2 and 1. When you have a guy with the arm that Jeff Samarja has, not a lot is straight, and that also makes it harder. We get excited about the radar gun these days. We have so much information, and we'll talk about this guy hitting 100 miles an hour, this guy sitting at 96, 97, and that's great. But what does it look like to the hitter? How straight is it? How much is it moving? Because big league hitters can hit 98 miles an hour if it's up over the plate and it's flat. It's the movement and the deception that make it so difficult. Kendrick pops it down the right field line. Long run for Bell, and it will fall to no man's land. And it's two and two. Let me talk about the Dodgers and their struggles on offense. Howie Kendrick, an example of why they feel like there will be some kind of bounce back coming soon collectively for this group. There's so many guys up and down the lineup that are hitting well below their career numbers for Dave Roberts. In the case of Howie Kendrick, he's never hit below 285 in his 10 big league seasons. Here in June, he's at 220. On 2-2, two -two, he takes ball three. Howie Kendrick has been a model of consistency throughout his career. It was kind of surprising that it took so long for him to find a home this past offseason. And that's some good news for the Dodgers. You mentioned guys that will get it turned around. They've had all kinds of injuries in the rotation has been a problem with Brandon McCarthy being out. Fred Anderson being out, Howie Kendrick, we talk about not performing. Puig is out, Ethier, and you're still only three games back of the division leader. That's a reason for optimism when you think about trying to climb back into this thing. And Kendrick takes ball four. And so two on with one out against Samarja. And up comes his counterpart, Scott Kazmir. Well there is a several start stretch for Scott Kazmir where he was dealing with something minor between his thumb and his wrist that kept him from swinging the bat. In fact it was swinging the bat that led to the injury. So he was going up there with no intent of swinging <laughs> at all. And there's still a few pitchers myself included that could probably <laughs> walk him in that situation. In a bunt situation here takes ball one so he finally gets healthy to swing the bat. And what does he do How about the first two hit game of his career last time out <laughs> and for pitchers you know this is one of these conversations that goes around should we go to the universal DH but there's probably not a pitcher in Major League Baseball that thinks that's a good idea they like facing each other but they love getting in there because this is an opportunity to pretend that you're a big league position player even though you were not good enough to hit at the big league level it's a lot of fun uh, to watch some of these guys Bartolo Colon has become a fan favorite around Major League Baseball. At any time, Madison Bumgarner is facing Clayton Kershaw. You certainly want to tune in to see that. 
What do you think about Mad Bum's uh, home run derby candidacy? It's a fun idea, but I'm dead set against it because yeah. I know Bruce Bochy is. And yeah, we'd all want to see it. It would be entertaining, but I'm not taking that chance if I'm the San Francisco Giants. I'm not even entertaining that idea <laughs> even a little bit. I don't have a conversation with him. It cannot happen. He takes batting practice. Yes, he's got some power. He takes a couple of rounds of BP the days he's pitching, maybe a little bit on days that he's not. He's not going to sit around for two or three hours and try to hit baseballs as hard as he possibly can. The risk versus reward is just not there for the San Francisco Giants. There's Clayton Kershaw, who we're scheduled to visit with today during the fourth inning. Kazmir with one more try laying it down and he bunts it in the air foul and caught by Posey. So Kazmir unable to move the runners up and up comes Chase Utley with two gone. This is another one of those situations where people will say things like how hard can it be just get in there and get the bunt down. Well you have a Jeff Samarja fastball that is not straight. It's also up in the zone. You are taught fundamentally when you are bunting to start your bat at the top of the zone and never go up to get the ball. But it's easier said than done. And for Scott Casimir, he thought he could get on top of that fastball, did not have a chance. Ideally, he pulls the bat back there and lets that pitch go. But you don't have a lot of time to make that decision. Samarja's only strikeout of the game started the game against Utley, but he saw eight pitches in that at bat. As Grandall at second, Kendrick at first, and a one run game in the second. Second season in a Dodger uniform for the Southern California native. Played his college ball at UCLA, grew up in Long Beach. He came over from the Phillies last August. He's fooled and it's 0 2. And that is a nasty slider from Jeff Samarja as he buries that ball, the term we use when you are a right handed pitcher to a left handed hitter back foot. You see this ball is down by his back foot. The idea that it's a strike almost the entire way falls out of the zone. Very difficult for a left hander to lay off that pitch when you're already behind in the count 0 1. Two on, two out in the second, and an 0 2. Got it. Dodgers get on the board with a base hit from Yasmani Grandal to score Trace Thompson, whose brother Clay is here watching and loving it.
sponsored by Bud Light. Raise one to right now. And right now, it is a perfect night for a perfect rivalry. Dodgers and Giants meeting for the 2,278th time. Going back to the 1890s in New York. Two teams relocated across the country together in 1958. Scott Casimir delivers strike one to Gregor Blanco, hitting out of the eighth spot tonight. And making the start in right field. Well, the Giants have dropped four of their last five. They're four and six in their last ten games. That comes on the heels of a 15 and two run, where they were by far the best team in baseball and extended the division lead to as wide as five and a half. They've done it in spite of the offense struggling three and one on Blanco and you see Scott Kazmier again struggling I believe with that fastball not feeling comfortable when he's behind the count just trying to throw that ball over the plate the release point has been inconsistent you see him yanking that ball one certainly when he expects to be a lot closer to the plate. Giants enter the game with a three game lead in the division. Last time the Dodgers had been within two of San Francisco was back in mid May, towards the beginning of the Giants 15 and 2 run. Asmir's 3 2 is outside and he's walked his third man. Play ball is MLB's initiative to inspire all forms of baseball and softball participation, making play opportunities available and fun for everyone. To learn more, go to playball.org. Surprised at how hot it feels today. Oftentimes, even if it is warm in town, you're sitting right on the bay here and you get the water, the, the breeze coming in. Absolutely. A little more humid than I think yeah. we're used to when we're sitting up here, but one thing never changes when you come to San Francisco. This is, for me, far and away the best view from any booth I think that we get to work in. There's always a good crowd, always good energy here in San Francisco. One of the most beautiful venues that Major League Baseball has to offer. Jeff Samarja swings and misses. China Basin. Beyond the outfield wall. McCovey Cove. Brandon Belt hit a home run out there earlier this week against Boston. Barry Bonds used to live out there, his home runs. Surprisingly, Belt's home run, I think it was Wednesday against Boston, was the first splash hit, as they call it, since 2014. Is that right? Well, yeah. they got to go clear, and we see ones that bounce him, but that's got to right, go clear right. and over everything. And if I remember correctly, I thought we, we saw a guy jump in after it. A lot of times, people out there in kayaks and everything else, mm -hmm. we watched a guy jump in. Samarja lays it down. Grandal goes to second in time, and they turn the double play. And no doubt the uh, process will kick into gear in that Giants dugout to see if they want to challenge. How about the aggressiveness of Yosmani Grandal right here this bunt Samarja hit the top half of it and Grandal did not even hesitate and you cannot on that play if you want to go for that lead runner you know it's going to be close but watch this ball just kind of die right in front of home plate Grandal knew he was going to have an opportunity and I believe that they got him and that's going to be a double play I don't think we're going to see a challenge Blanco appeared to be out. So one six four with Utley cover in the bag. Or two six four. A lot of times we remark on umpires when they make mistakes, mm -hmm. but that looked like a really really tough call to make, and maybe even the wrong call to the naked eye. But worth noting that John Hirschbeck had it right. Perfect positioning. Denard span in the second trip through for the Giants. 
Well, I think you make a fair point for the umpires now with the replay, with all the replays that we even offer on television, they're under scrutiny more than ever. And so it makes their job a little bit more difficult. They'll take more criticism than they ever have before. But these guys still do an excellent job. The calls that they can make when you're watching it in real time at full speed, it's always amazing. Yeah, they're going to miss some, and that's why we have replay. But these guys do an excellent job and definitely deserve probably a lot more credit than they've got. There they are. Crew chief is John Hirschbeck who made that call. Now about that balk yesterday though maybe yeah that's <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what I wouldn't mind maybe uh, talking about because I'm still not sure I'm completely on board with that call against Johnny Cueto. Two and one on span. And an, an umpire told me this one time and I always thought it was really interesting I never thought about it before it's a great job it's a difficult job to get it's a good job to have but umpires never have home games they are on the road the entire time and never are they playing in front of a home crowd. Span flips a fly ball to left. Kendrick dives and makes the play. He had a late break and that ball kept on spinning away from him. But Kendrick who's playing a lot of left field for the first time in a long time sprawled out and brought it in. Jump some margin to Corey Seeger with ball one to get this third inning going. Giants getting two in the first against Scott Casimir. Dodgers run coming in the second against Samarja. It was 1 0 pitch. It was grounded foul. And we mentioned it earlier about how Jeff Samarja will throw that cutter a ton behind in the count. 1 0 and he comes back with that cutter against Corey Seager the same pitch that he retired him on in his first at bat it's been pretty incredible to see from both of these guys basically pitching backwards not throwing fastballs in fastball counts. Posey set it in for a 1 1 and it's hit off of the handle down the left field line foul. We've had some success and we have had some failures when you put infielders into the outfield. But Howie Kendrick, as you watch here on StatCast covering 65 feet, you see the route efficiency at 97%. A great play, great instincts. 
all that matters to Scott Casimir is was the, that he caught that ball and a really nice play by Howie Kendrick. We've seen some guys struggle. Hanley Ramirez could not play left field. We've seen other infielders go to the outfield like Billy Hamilton, Mookie Betts be great. You never quite know what you're going to get. Seager with a fly ball to left. And Williamson has it. Stackhouse is powered by Amazon Web Services. Route efficiency is at 97, right? It did, yeah. With 100 being a perfectly straight line between the spot that you begin the play and the spot that the ball winds up falling. You got to be careful. It's, it's an interesting number, but also there are times where outfielders are going to get fooled. Uh -huh. There's going to be a ball that's jammed. They're going to take a big swing. They're going to hit off the end of the bat. So a lot of times they may take that initial step backwards, and so that'll affect that route efficiency a little bit. But that doesn't necessarily mean it was a bad play if that number drops. It's not. Uh, it's not a be-all, end-all, but it's an interesting number that we've seen from Statcast. Justin Turner, who hit the game-winning double in the ninth inning last night, had an opposite field. A game when he homer last night opposite field double and his first dab bat tonight. It's on this 1 0 and takes ball two. Dodgers hoping that he can break out hitting 221 this season coming into the game. We we're talking with Dave Roberts before the game about some of the offense's struggles. He talked about what he calls the flight plan. And in the case of Turner. His struggles have kind of reflected a poor flight plan. Would that be not that he's had a bad plan at the play, but sure. explain what he meant by flight plan. Well, it's interesting. You look at, say, using Turner as an example, as a right-handed hitter. He is saying balls to the opposite field, you should be thinking ground ball. To right field, you want the ball on the ground, to the right side. You start getting towards center field, that swing plane should be closer to giving you line drives, and then he wants you pulling the ball a little bit more in the air for home runs. We even talked to Hensley Mullins about this, the hitting coach for the San Francisco Giants, and saying, you got to get some of your guys to actually start trying to go ahead and pull the ball in in the air and trying to hit these home runs because there's a lot of guys that have become such inside out hitters and so in the case of for Dave Roberts and what he wants his club doing is thinking opposite field ground balls up the middle line drives and then to your pull side hitting that ball in the air and a lot of that has to do with the shifts too right there are so many shifts on dead pull hitters and when these guys are pulling the ball on the ground those balls are turning into outs more than ever in Major League Baseball and so Turner's a lot of his outs have come as fly balls to right his fly ball rate is the highest of his career here's a fly ball that he sends to left center Williamson back on it at the track with room for the second out of the inning time now for a game break we say hello to Kevin Burkhardt in Los Angeles. Okay. All right, Kevin. Yeah, USA one and one in Copa America. Second in Group A right now. There's Adrian Gonzalez with the bases empty and two gone. So we were uh, arguing after our meeting with Dave. Was he saying flight plan <laughs> or flight plane? Because either one really works. If you think flight plane. Picture for a right handed hitter a line that starts high in the air and left and angles down to the ground and right. You're still pushing flight plane aren't you. I mean it works doesn't I, it. It does but he said flight plane. That's why I carry a nice notebook. I saw you taking your notes on. So I don't know what that was. A, it was a, uh, a Weston notepad yeah, from the from the hotel. That's why I wrote it down. But it does make sense. You can you can use it both ways. But you think about what is the flight plan. This is the plan he wants these guys uh, to be able to try to implement. It's not an easy thing to do but it makes a ton of sense. Especially now like I mentioned because there are so many shifts and so many ground balls are now outs. Here's a bouncing ball to a well positioned panic who gets Gonzalez and completes a one two three third inning Buster Posey do up third in the bottom half of a two one game.
Joe Panic sent the lead off the bottom of the third in a two on game. That's a breaking ball strike from Scott Casimir. Panic grounded out to second his first time. Scott Casimir has not had his best command so far today. He's walked three, he has only one strikeout. Giants getting the two runs in the first inning. Four consecutive two out base runners. One and two. Now, between innings, we asked if folks around here would dislike the fact that Clay Thompson <laughs> had a Dodger hat on. They booed him when they showed him on the video board. I'm talking this place erupted <laughs> in boos. They absolutely rained those boos on him. And you just wonder, like I said, I thought it would be something maybe they'd be okay with because his brother's here, but it's all right. The Warriors are playing well. They're about to get themselves another championship, or at least it's looking that way. Does not matter here to Giants fans. They are going to boo a Dodger hat every single time, no matter what. Panic down on strike. Steve Kerr got a standing ovation when they showed him. <laughs> On the video board, it's his son Nick Kerr who walked on at Cal this last year. I think though what, what you're maybe seeing with the booing of Clay is that while we know Trace's brother is Clay, uh -huh. and that's kind of an accepted fact. <laughs> I think folks are still learning that Clay's brother is Trace. <laughs> that's kind of how it works, absolutely. And I think, like I said, I don't know how much tolerance there will ever be. I'm not sure. I can't. I'm trying to think of a figure that could walk in here with a Dodger hat that wouldn't get booed. There may not. There may not be too many that mm -hmm. exist. I'm thinking the Pope's going to hear it for sure. <laughs> He'll boom right out of this place. How about Vin Scully? I think Vin Ooh. could walk in here. Not that Vin would ever walk in anywhere wearing a Dodger <laughs> hat, but good one and it's crazy to think that the Pope was a no brainer right the Pope for sure is getting booed Vince Scully uh, yeah, I'm not right. so sure about Vince Scully maybe not belt in the air to left Howie Kendrick with the second out Buster Posey to bat with two gone remember he lost the bat and uh, swing during his first day B got lodged in the net and immediately after he went to break following that half inning they brought out a huge ladder to get it down. I missed all that I didn't even see it actually no. as he was coming up I just went to look and realized the bat was gone. I don't know how I'm missing a huge ladder in the middle of a baseball <laughs> field tells you what I'm doing in between innings. He's taking a look up there. This is a flashback to when wow. they they do make a, a ladder that big. I uh -huh. didn't think they could get up that high. Now the question is, will he use it again? Is that if that? I mean, he didn't make good contact. Question. It didn't hit anything, and that's probably in perfectly good working order. Is he using it right now? Is that it? Now you got something to do after the game and find out for us, Joe. Yeah, I think <laughs> I might have something else on the schedule <laughs> that'll take priority. Kazmir trying to work his first one, two, three inning of the afternoon. Yeah, barely misses two and two on Posey. Scott Kazmir is starting to look a little bit more comfortable. We talked about it with Jeff Samarja, the first inning troubles that he had a year ago. Early on for Kazmir, it was release point consistency on the fastball, but near the end of that second inning and now here into the third inning, he is looking a lot more comfortable. Twelfth major league season for Kazmir with a sixth different team. His 2 2 to Buster Posey. In front of the plate, that's a fair ball. Grandall's got it and tags Posey out to end the inning. First 1 2 3 frame of the day for Kazmir in a 2 1 game in San Francisco.
Christmas is brought to you by the Lincoln Motor Company and the exhilarating MKZ. And by T-Mobile, bringing you greater coverage of today's game. Back in San Francisco where the Giants lead the Dodgers 2-1. On to the fourth inning with C.J. Nikowski, Joe Davis, and Trace Thompson to lead off the frame against Jeff Samarja. Social media is weighing in, and they said no chance that they would ever boo Vin Scully, even here in San Francisco. Right. I think that would be the, the consensus. The key in our conversation was wearing a Dodger hat, <laughs> right? Dodger sweater. Right. If there's ever anybody to get away with coming in here and being put on a video board <laughs> with the Dodger hat on, it's him. <laughs> Not him. <laughs> Comes an 0-1 to his brother. And it's low. One ball and one strike. Thompson is one for one today. He singled and then advanced his second on a fly out to left. And it was because of that hustle that the Dodgers got their only run so far. On the Osmani Grandal single. One and two. You see Thompson right here way out in front of a breaking ball from Jeff Samarji in a 1-1 count. And what he has done now is set him up if he wants to with the fastball. We call it talk about throttling a lot of times, hard to soft, and we'll see if they try to go fastball away. He does, and Thompson lifts it in the air to right. This is Blocko for the first out. Between innings, we talk with Dave Rigetti, Jeff Samarja's pitching coach, and asked him what the organization saw to bring Samarja here after a rough year last year. For our GM and our uh, front office, you know, that's not part of my job, but I think they saw the innings. The, our bullpen really got beat up the last year, and uh, we needed some innings badly, and um, so that's what they did. They, you know, they brought in the Zimmermans, the Quatos, the Samarjas, the Grinkies, the people that they, and they made an effort that they were going to do that. Yeah, it's been nice to have those additions. What about yes, in sir. particular, or particularly what you have done with Jeff Samarja? Bruce Bochy was telling us a little bit about the arm angle. We're seeing sure. him use more cutters. What did you do with him once you got a hold of him in spring training? CJ, it's, uh, you know, you guys are all built a certain way, and Jeff's always been comfortable turning on the mound. And, but you got to be really careful with what you do when you come back out of that turn. Johnny Cueto does it as good as anybody. You get that front arm back up and work over the ball. So you got different angles and not always on the same plane. And so it's it's really big his timing coming out of that turn and how he finishes. Otherwise, every pitch is just going to be running towards a right handed hitter, right? We appreciate the time, Dave. You're welcome, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting there if you sometimes people have a hard time following some of the pitcher jargon, but basically what he was talking about with Jeff Sabarja was trying to eliminate some of that body turn to get him a little bit more consistent. He felt like if he turned a little bit too much in the way that Cueto does, and Cueto probably turns uh, more than anybody, maybe since we've seen Hideo Nomo as far as how much of a turn he has in his delivery. It sounds like they tried to limit that a little bit to get him in a better position. There is a rocket to deep right center off of the bat of Jack Peterson and off of the wall on top of that 421 sign. Peterson hit it to the deepest part of the yard. The only part of the yard that would have swallowed it up to one out double. Well, Jack Peterson is not used to hitting baseballs this hard and them not leaving the ball yard. Good job of keeping his hands in and even watch him as we see him take a little bit of a look at that pitch. But that is absolutely smoking. It's 421 to the gap. He probably hit that ball right around 425 off of that cement wall. That's about as hard as you can hit a ball that is not going to leave a ballpark here in Major League Baseball. And a really good at bat and a fastball that was left over the middle of the plate. And the one thing about Jack, Jack Peterson watching him, he may swing as hard as anybody in Major League Baseball. He never gets cheated, never takes a short hack, always full effort. And when he gets a hold of one, he absolutely can launch. And our Grandall, who drove in the first Dodger run of the day, has a chance to tie the game against Samarja here in the fourth. just quickly finishing that point on what Dave Rigetti was talking about it's essentially more consistency it was a rough year last year for Jeff Samarja nearly a five ERA very small tweak for them that they took care of in spring training that they felt like has really paid dividends here in 2016. Now last year Samarja had a 496 earned run average with the White Sox 
Gave up more hits, more home runs than any pitcher in the American League. He gave up 29 home runs. Is 2 0. Right down the middle. He didn't necessarily want it there. Grandall took it for strike one. You mentioned the bad year that he had, the struggles that he had, but yet he still gets five years, $90 million in the offseason. A lot of what Dave Rigetti was talking about, and he didn't want to step out of turn and speak with the front office, but it was the innings that this ball club could certainly use, but also the stuff. The stuff was still there, and they believed that they, if they got him in this environment, one that has been so good for pitchers. We talked about the defense, but also Dave Rigetti and his 17 years of running things here and running this pitching staff to go along with Bruce Bochy. They felt like if they brought him in this environment, he could excel and be back to where he was, and they have certainly accomplished that. His 3 1 to Grandall is over the outside corner, perfectly placed or on the count full. Samarge so over his fourth team in the last two plus seasons the Cubs and then the A's and the White Sox, and the five year, $90 million deal this offseason. Tying run is second in the fourth, and Samarja to Grandall with a 3 2. Just misses up. That's ball four. Second walk of the game from Samarja. They're at first and second with one gone. The best seats at every ballpark for every game. Visit MLB.com slash tickets today. Now certainly not an ideal situation to put another runner on first and second now potential go ahead run but if you can get that ground ball from Cowie Hen Cowie excuse me Howie Kendrick and turn that double play that walk could turn into a positive here for Jeff Samarja. Kendrick walked his first time. As Peterson at second, Grandall at first. And waits on this 1 0. A little bit outside, 2 0. And you see the stare from Jeff Samarja even stepping in front of the rubber after he throws that pitch. That is a call. That he is that he wants now the velocity looked a little bit low but that's a two seam fastball it came back over the plate he thought it caught the corner but he did not get that call from home plate umpire Bill Welke. Two and one. And watch this pitch right here. It's going to start off the plate. This is the 1 0 and comes back just a little bit. Buster Posey barely moves the glove. Now, had he moved the glove a lot, then you could say it's probably a ball. A lot of times catchers will give that away by too much movement. But even Buster Posey, I believe, thought that was a strike, the fact that he stuck that glove so still. I don't know. I mean, 86 wasn't a fast home. It was a bad read on the gun, which happens sometimes. Yeah. He doesn't really throw. A straight change. It might have just been a bad gun read. Not easy to line a ball that sharply at that angle. They lined it. Watch how he Kendrick here. His ball starts to run back in, and there was instant frustration. You see him on his part. Now I don't know if he thought that that was a ball and he shouldn't have swung at it, or if he thought he should have get the barrel to it a little bit quicker. Straight on a line over that first base dugout. Now the 2 2. Tailed hit on him. And again, that is such a good look at that tailing action from Samarja. Well, it's 96 miles an hour, excuse me, 96 miles an hour movement. Look at the end of that pitch and how much that ball comes barreling in. Now, the only thing I'll say is that it is staying on that same plane that is up. But if you think you're going to swing at that pitch as a right handed hitter and get the barrel to it and keep it fair, good luck. Two on with one out in the fourth. And a 2 2 to Howie Kendrick. Continues to battle Samarja. You see the raw stuff of Jeff Samarja. That was, we asked Bruce Bochi, how do you go out and sign a guy to the deal that he was signed to after the season he had? He talked about those raw abilities, the raw stuff that Samarja had that hadn't changed necessarily last season. There's some small tweaks that needed to be made. They like the idea of him pitching in this pitcher friendly ballpark. And with this good defense around him. 
Oh, absolutely. And even though he is a little bit older at 33, it's not necessarily uh, the same 33 that you see, excuse me, 31 that you see in other guys because he doesn't have the mileage that a lot of guys will have at their age. A guy who went back and forth between uh, the bullpen early on in his career starting rotation. Runner takes off. Peterson's gone. Posey throws him out for out number two. Curious decision there by Jock Peterson. You're talking about Buster Posey, one of the best of the, in the game, throwing out 47% of runners. And the idea of trying to steal third base on him in that situation, that is either a missed sign or a bad read or a really bad idea by Jock Peterson. And so now Samarge is a strike away from this inning ending. His 3 2. That's a base hit to right. And Grandall on his way to third on a base hit from Kendrick. And as they say, that puts coals, hot coals, on Jack Peterson's shoulders. Yeah, that certainly is discouraging for the Los Angeles Dodgers. That should have been the run, the base hit that drove in the run to tie the game. But watch how we Kendrick here. We saw him battling all those fastballs that were up and in. Well, that one doesn't get in far enough, and it ends up sitting out over the middle of the plate and up. Does a really nice job of hitting that ground ball to the right side. Good flight plan there as we talk <laughs> about it. Ground balls, that is what Dave Roberts wants to see to the right side. Pull in the air, ground balls to the right. Good at bat by Howie Kendrick. Now Scott Kazmir with men at the corners and two gone. And so what very likely would have been a game tying single instead puts runners at the corners and puts the pressure on Kazmir to tie it. Ahead of him, 0 and 2, but four of the five Dodger hits so far today have come with two strikes. Little jam shot cut off by Duffy, and he gets Casimir. Dodgers stranded at the corners, a 2-1 game. Clayton Kershaw joins us when we come back from break.
go to the bottom of the fourth. San Francisco getting their two runs in the first inning against Scott Kazmir. Dodgers getting their run in the second against Samarja. We're joined by last night's Dodgers starting and winning pitcher Clayton Kershaw. Clayton, we appreciate you taking some time to spend with us this afternoon. Yeah, thanks, guys. What's going on? It uh, doesn't get much better than this, huh? I mean, look at the blue skies and this rivalry. Nice day today. Yeah, it's about as hot as you get in St. Fran, so we'll take it. Yeah, we we're saying the same thing. Not really yeah. feeling the breeze off the water like normal. You uh, been a part of this rivalry for a while now. It's special for us to sit up here and watch it. What is it like to pitch in this Dodger Giant rivalry? Well, you know, I think more than anything, it just means that we've been good. You know, uh, the Giants and Dodgers have been winning the division now for a while, and obviously the Giants have, you know, had the upper hand just because they've won three World Series in the last six years. So. Um, you know that's what we're shooting for obviously but um, it's definitely fun to come up here and pitch awesome atmosphere weekend series like this uh, they always sell out so it's a, it's a ton of fun to come up here and uh, fans let you know it certainly is a lot of fun and it has been a lot of fun to watch you pitch not only this year but really throughout most of your career you've been an unbelievable model of consistency that is not an easy thing to do a lot of guys can have a couple of good years here and there there's usually a down year in there somewhere that has not been the case for you talk to us a little bit about how you've gotten to that point where year after year you're having such consistent dominant seasons uh, you know I don't know honestly I think for me it's just trying to focus on the small things you know just go start to start um, not worry about the whole year not worry about multiple years just try and win every start and then you know from there the consistency kicks in and um, you know all that other peripheral stuff really isn't important just trying to uh, eat up a lot of innings and let everything else take care of itself. Scott Kazmir working on Matt Duffy Crawford and Williamson to follow in this fourth inning. Now I know last night you had said that the slider wasn't at its best fastball numbers were really good when you go into a start how long does it take before you can feel something like that that the slider might not be at its best. Uh, you know I think the good thing is I'm so stubborn during the start that I just <laughs> think everything's working and then you know when you look back after I almost had that you look back <laughs> after and then you realize that stuff wasn't working so fortunately for me maybe unfortunately I just keep throwing it even if it's not working. Please please do not stick your hand up and try to catch one of those <laughs> line drives and you will get us and our bosses in a ton of trouble uh, with the Los Angeles Dodgers shows a conversation that goes on uh, at least from this part of the game amongst analysts amongst people that follow the numbers about pitchers wins and a lot of people think that there's not a lot of value in them. I always say pitchers absolutely believe that there are values in them for you. Would you rather throw a shutout and get a no decision or maybe you have what would be an off game for you which might only be seven innings and two runs but you still get the win. Explain to people why pitchers wins are so important to pitchers. Well I, I kind of disagree for the most part. I'd rather I mean do we win the no decision or not as a team. I ah, think that's, so uh, that, that qualifier uh, does kind of yeah, matter a little bit. I understand yeah. team wins are the most important but what about pitcher wins are, are they overvalued. Well you know I think at the end of the day they might be a little overvalued but it's still it feels good to look up and see your record being a winning record or something like that as opposed to being you know two and six or something like that even if you're pitching well you know I think the confidence factor and having a good record uh, uh, it definitely helps but yeah I mean I think you can nowadays look at a lot of other things and understand how how well a guy is pitching or not. You're killing me dude. Brian Kenny is going to be all over me now. This is the guy that I we argue about this all the time because I feel always feel like you want to have the quality outing and but you still want to have the wins because pitchers love seeing especially for a guy like yourself who's done it twice now where you've gone up over 20 wins but man I'm going to get killed for that one. Well, Clayton yeah. Kershaw saying yeah they're a little bit overvalued. <laughs> well what I'm I will trouble, say, man. Yeah, I mean what I will say though is that there are certain pitchers out there that that know how to win games that always keep your team in games and uh, you can see that you know we had a guy for the last three years Zach Greinke that. Um, you know even this year he started off slow but he's still you know eight and three or something like that he just knows how to win um, and uh, you can see that over the course of a career so there's definitely guys out there like that that no matter what their uh, you know peripheral numbers are they always know how to win the game it's a good at bat right now yeah unfortunately <laughs> Absolutely. Now, there was an, almost an opportunity here at one point where the Dodgers looked like there was an outside chance that it could be an all lefty rotation before Kenta Maeda came in. It was Alex Wood, yourself, Brad Anderson before he got hurt. And of course, Scott Kasner. How fun would have that been maybe to go with potentially five lefties in that rotation? <laughs> yeah, we had some good scouting. You know, we could have just watched <laughs> everybody and talked about it. Uh, yeah, you don't see that a lot for sure. But, you know, I enjoy all the guys we have right now. And Kent has been a huge addition in that. Uh, that hurts right there. Lead off walk, 10 pitch at bat or something. That's no fun at all. Yeah, nine pitches. Duffy walks to lead off the inning. We're rolling in some of uh, your highlights from last night's start. 
Now, the, I'm sure you don't look at this stuff, but they were 0 for 14 against your fastball, as good as your fastball statistically has ever been. Did it feel any different, the fastball coming out, than it ever does? Um, you know, I think it was kind of two things. One is that, yeah, I feel like I had pretty decent command of it last night, uh, hitting my spot away to lefties and into righties. But, um, you know, I faced five lefties last night, and then the same thing that Kaz is going through right now, um, which, which usually never happens. You know, they usually stack the lineup with the righties. So, um, something that was kind of a focus going in was just to establish the fastball away to those lefties. And, um, you know, fortunately for me, it worked out for the most part. I gave up some hard hit balls to center and things like that that, uh, you know, maybe on a day like today, it might have gone out of here. Uh, but last night, they kept him in the park. So uh, some good fortune there that I'll take for sure. You know, when we start to look in and look at your pitch selection and pitch usage over the years, there has not been a lot of changes. Is there anything significant in your repertoire since you first got to the big leagues in 2008 that has changed very much? Well, I, you know, I just think just the slider. You know, I didn't even have a slider when I came in the big leagues and uh, figured out real quick that I needed a third pitch and uh, started throwing that. And uh, it's just I've gained more confidence with it over the years and now you know I feature it even more than my curveball just easier to throw for a strike so um, for me that's been a huge pitch for me. And by the Crawford two and one the curveball that you mentioned it's dominant it's fun to watch I tell people all the time that is the curveball to watch from a left hander the break that you get on it, the finish that you get on it, the pitch just seems to never stop breaking but it doesn't roll in there it has huge break but it has dominant break. Uh, at the end of it tell us a little bit about the history of that pitch because for me it is one of the best that we have seen in a very long time. Um, yeah you know I don't know if there's a whole lot of history other than that's just kind of how I've always thrown it and uh, you know I, I I'm sure somebody along the way showed me how to uh, hold it and showed me how to break it off and um, you don't remember who though that yeah. guy's sitting there somewhere saying it was me it was <laughs> me. Yeah I know he's probably <laughs> mad at me right now No, I can't think of the name off the top of my head but. Um, yeah, just, you know, over the course of time, just trying to figure out how to throw it for strikes has been the biggest thing for me. And, um, you know, even last night, I, I didn't, I threw more balls and strikes with it, but uh, just kept being stubborn and kept throwing it. Three and two on Crawford. Clayton, what's it been like in a Dave Roberts led clubhouse this year? Yeah, Doc's been awesome. You know, a uh, ton of, ton of positive energy, as they say. You know, he's just, uh, just so optimistic and, uh, you know just a big clubhouse presence that um, you know I think is huge for us you know we got a lot of young guys now which is awesome and um, just every day the consistency that he brings and uh, the positivity and um, you know not not good or bad just different than what we had with Donnie you know I love Donnie here for as long as we had him but uh, it might be a good change this would be nice right here so. and they pull there it off go. Grandall yeah. throws down and gets Duffy yeah. And Crawford <laughs> Crawford heads back to the dugout with his strike him out throw him out. You're not ready to come in the booth. You seem to be enjoying a little of this man. You're doing a nice job on the field. At least let us have these jobs up here. Could you do that for us. <laughs> yeah I'll just say sick. Y'all can analyze it. Right. I'll just say sick. Yeah. Clayton before we let you go we want to make sure that we ask you about Kershaw's challenge. I know you and your wife Ellen really active off of the field as well. But tell us about Kershaw's challenge. Yeah just in a nutshell we started it uh, when we got married five years ago and um, now we have four different beneficiaries that we help out and uh, every year we raise money for four different beneficiaries and um, we have one in Africa one in the Dominican Republic and then one in LA and one in our hometown of Dallas and uh, Kershaw's challenge .com is the website but basically we're just trying to help kids uh, everything is geared towards kids whether it be uh, hospitals or uh, homes or anything like that we're trying to do everything we can so it's a uh, it's been an awesome thing for Ellen and I to get to do and uh, um, it's just been a, it's been an awesome platform for us to have baseball to get the word out and uh, thanks for mentioning it. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah we yeah. threw the website up on the screen. Yeah. Kershaw's challenge dot com. Smack Williamson takes the ball. You mentioned Kenta Maeda any Japanese now in the repertoire for you. Yeah so we had Kuroda here for a while. That's right. And so I knew I learned a little bit from him and uh, you know Kenta's teaching me some but I'll tell you what Kenta's awesome. He's yeah. uh, his personality is so great and. Uh, he's made the transition uh, seamless, you know, pitching once a, once a week to once every five days now in America. And I mean, he's, he's just doing awesome. I love having him around. That's a good inning right there, gentlemen. Fly ball to right. Yeah, Thompson's got it. We filled it perfectly. Clayton, we appreciate the time. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys.
in the Giants 5 2 but it's the Giants in front 2 1 as we begin the fifth inning and Chase Utley taking strike one from Jeff Samarja who has two strikeouts so far and ironically they're both against the guy that coming into the game had dominated him historically. Utley's average against Samarja before today was 389. And a soft pop up to short left center. Williamson and Span, and it's Williamson to make the play. Well, the All Star game not too far off. David Ortiz, Bryce Harper, Mike Trout, you name it, all baseball superstars coming together for the primetime event on Fox. MLB All Star game from San Diego this year on July 12th. Certainly should be a lot of fun. There will be a lot of competition going on for some spots. And Corey Seegers, we see him stepping up to the plate. A guy that deserves, for me, more votes than he has gotten so far. Sometimes the All Star game will turn into a popularity contest. There are certain fan bases that get more involved than others. But when you think about the National League and shortstops, Corey, Corey Seager, I believe, is fifth right now. I don't think he's even in the top five. Oh, he's not even no. in the top five, which is pretty hard to believe when you look at the year that he is having. It's got to be there. He's probably not going to get voted in because of the way things are going right now. But without a doubt, this guy has been an all-star so far this year. There's Brandon Crawford, who led all shortstops and RBIs last year. Seeker's been a better hitter than Crawford so far this year. What a shortstop rookie class again mm -hmm. this year. In the National League alone, outside of Seeger, you've got Trevor Story in Colorado. You've got Alebnis Diaz in St. Louis. There's his ranks among all shortstops in the NL, yet he's not in the top five in voting. And as interesting as that is, and it's going to be, and that should go down to the wire and should be a good vote, what about the American League? And thinking mm -hmm. about what is going to be happening maybe over the next decade, Francisco Lindor, Carlos Correa, Cattell Marte is really good. Xander Bogarts is having a monster season. These guys are all really young. They're all really good. This is a fun time right now to be a baseball fan and take a look at the shortstop that Major League Baseball is dishing out. Seeger takes strike three over the outside corner and three K's for Samarja. Two gone in the fifth. And up comes Justin Turner. This is a tough pitch right here against the lefty. A little bit of a backdoor and just kind of catches the outside corner. Just Samarja not necessarily getting that call on the other side against the righty. Corey Seeger did not think that that pitch was a strike, but. When Buster Posey receives it that way and gives home plate umpire Bill Welke a good look at it, chances are the rookie's going to get that call against him. Samarja looking for his first or his second 1 2 3 inning of the day and has Justin Turner behind an elevated fastball, strike one. Turner, the former Oriole, former Met. Came to the Dodgers before the 2014 season and has had two really good offensive years. And over the last two years, he's been tied with Buster Posey for the number one batting average in the National League. That's 2014 and 15 combined. Both those guys hit 314 in those two seasons. And you see that good slider right there from Jeff Samarge at 88 miles an hour. Justin Turner is about as best value I think that you could get we don't think of the Dodgers when it comes to value but you mentioned those two years and what he was putting up over that time now it's been a little bit of a slower start but ever since he arrived in Los Angeles he has been a huge difference maker Don Mattingly was a big fan always trying to keep him in that lineup any way that he could it looked like maybe he was going to go into that super utility role but instead he found that home at third base and hit so well that there was no way that he was going to lose that spot he's been a big piece to this Los Angeles Dodgers puzzle and he's done it at a very inexpensive rate and scalds a single right by the ear of Samarja into center and Justin Turner showing signs so far this weekend of coming out of that season long slump absolutely and look at this view right here we see the turn from Samarja we talked about that a little bit this is actually a pretty good pitch at his down but Justin Turner's all over it and even dealing with the shadows which can be a little bit difficult as that ball goes to dark right before he swings at it. Samarja turns his back. Very dangerous there. And you see his facial expression. But now a couple of really good at-bats by Justin Turner. The line drive to right field in his first at-bat for the double. And now that single up the middle. That is a sign of a guy who looks like he's about ready to break out. And it's all coming on the heels of his game-winning home run last night. As Adrian Gonzalez takes ball one. 
You know, people can say what they want about momentum. Some people don't buy into it, but what it does create is more of a positive attitude, and I think that's certainly something for Justin Turner. You start seeing some little pieces of success, and mentally you start to feel a little bit better, and things start coming together, and I think the two hard-hit balls that we have seen from him indicate that after that home run, that was a big one. That was a huge one for him. Uh, now to see him hitting these line drives is certainly a good sign. He's got a big lead at first in front of this 1 0 pitch. And Gonzalez hammers a fly ball to right center field. Block goes back on it at the track and it hits off the wall. Adrian Gonzalez has tied this game with a two out double. That ball was absolutely pummeled by Gonzalez. Uh, it certainly was. It tried to go away with that two-seamer, let that ball run, but watch Buster Posey reach back over the middle of the plate. Adrian Gonzalez takes a look at it for a minute because this ball was absolutely smoked, much like Jock Peterson's was, but this is a huge ballpark, and it holds these kind of balls and a big double with two outs, and all of a sudden now, here come the Los Angeles Dodgers with some solid contact as they go around for the third time against Jeff Samarja. Since the beginning or since August of 2012, which is when the Dodgers acquired Adrian Gonzalez in that blockbuster deal from Boston, he has more RBIs than any player in the National League. Bruce Bochy coming out, likely making a change with action down in that San Francisco bullpen. And George Contos will come into the game for Samarja. Dodgers have tied it on a two out double from Gonzalez. Going to show us here what Adrian Gonzalez did to this baseball as he crushes it in the right center gap, 102 miles an hour off the bat, 411 feet. It's only good for a double here <laughs> in San Francisco. And we saw Jock Peterson settle for a double, that deep part of the yard swallowing it up on a ball that was hit probably more than 400 feet as well earlier in this game. Grace Thompson against George Cantos taking ball one. Kanto's on for the 20th time an ERA around three and a half. Although he's not allowed a run since May 27. It's a span of seven consecutive outings without giving one up. Thompson trying to put the Dodgers in front for the first time. 
on this 1-0. He pulls one, just foul. And one of the things that sticks out in the Contos numbers you saw was just nine strikeouts in 15 innings. It's not a huge swing and miss guy, so it's about the contact, inducing weak contact. Does not throw a lot of fastballs either. Uh, this is a guy who relies heavily on his slider, heavily on his cutter as well, uh, keeping hitters off balance. Just 43% of his pitches are fastballs, which is a low number, very similar uh, to what we saw from Jeff Samarja, who started this game. Savard's the last four and two thirds. Runner at second, his responsibility. He allows seven hits. He walks two, struck out three. Dodgers trying to put him on the hook for a loss. If Trace Thompson can cash in with his brother Clay watching. I'm going to put him on the big board again, though. Don't get, do it. Get him booed. Yeah. At the rate information travels today though I'm sure the folks that booed him not knowing that his brother played for the Dodgers by now know. <laughs> Absolutely word is out and uh, so I wonder now would I guess not Giants fans are not going to be conflicted at all anytime Trace Thompson comes to the plate no. does not matter. No. World championships in basketball doesn't matter how many that he brings to this area. You wear that Dodger blue you get booed here when you're in San Francisco. Gonzalez is second with a game tying double and a 2 2 to Thompson. Tries to lay off but can't. Contos gets the job done, striking out Thompson. But the Dodgers have even the issue at two with a Gonzalez double. Sponsored by Pepsi. Tell the world how you feel and what you love with Pepsi emojis. Say it with Pepsi. Back in San Francisco, out there in China Basin. I don't even see some Dodger blue. I think I see a Mike Piazza. Is that a Mike Piazza Dodger t shirt? It's courageous. Yeah. Courageous spot to wear that shirt right on the uh, right on the edge of the boat. You could read that Ruiz jersey from space. <laughs> <laughs> Some pretty big, pretty big letters. Stephen Vote shirt on the guy there on the left. So here we go into the bottom of the fifth inning, and Scott Casimir to Gregor Blanco is strike one. Blanco walked his first time. The walks. The story and the two runs that Casimir's allowed. He walked two with two outs in the first, and both came in to score. One and one.
fastball command is certainly looking a lot better for Scott Casimir after getting settled in. You talked about those two two out walks, but ultimately came back to hurt him in those two runs scored in the first inning. But since then, and really toward the end of that second inning, the fastball command has really improved. Ready for a one two and Blanco hits a fly ball to left for Howie Kendrick who had some trouble with that ball at this stage of the day maybe dealing with some sun. The shades might help. Out number one. And now greater coverage of baseball sponsored by T-Mobile. We've talked about the injury issues for the Giants. How about the differences in the last two seasons with Hunter Pence in the lineup and without. They're a full run per game better when he's in there. 26 games above 500 with him, 10 below without him. Without a doubt, he is a difference maker, and one of the biggest reasons, I mean, obviously he can hit, but the fact that he's right-handed, and we see a lot of lefties here right now uh, in that San Francisco Giants lineup, and so he is a guy that helps you to mix that lineup a little bit, but also brings good power into the middle of it. We're going to miss him while he is out now here uh, for an extended period of time and some other guys getting opportunities and those guys certainly have to, to step up and get it done But there really is no replacing Hunter Pence here for the San Francisco Giants Romero Pena making his first big league at bat since 2014 when he was with the Braves He's bounced around some and was called up this week Getting ready to maybe kick a couple field goals just so. in case yeah. <laughs> in case there's a snap I don't know if I've ever seen that before. That was something. <laughs> Pence out for a couple of months after that hamstring surgery. Angel Pagan rehabbing this weekend, back from his hamstring problem. Buster Posey battling through that aggravated thumb. The pitching side of things, Romo has been out since early on this season. Matt Kane is on the disabled list as well. Pena pulls a one hopper to Seeger at short. Two gone. And you mentioned Matt Kane. He's another guy that dealing with a hamstring, and it seems like a little bit of an issue here in San Francisco, where they've been unfortunate to have to deal with hamstring injuries. We've seen it a lot, though, really, even over the last decade. As guys train harder than they ever have, they train smarter, but they train more. And a lot of times we were seeing these hamstrings be an issue for guys and the flexibility becomes so important, especially as you get a little bit older, as hard as some of these guys are working. Now Matt Cain threw a side session yesterday and felt good enough today where the team has said that he's likely to start on Monday against the Milwaukee Brewers to come off of the DL. Denard Span is 0 for 2. And he lifts one in the air down the left field line. Turner and Seeger both over, and Turner can't get there. These plays are so tough. Ideally, if the shortstop can get there, he's going to have the better angle. Corey Seager could not get there, and Justin Turner trying to catch that ball over his shoulder. You're running full speed, trying to cover that kind of distance. That is not an easy play. Great effort, though, by Turner. Who had that knee surgery as soon as the season ended last year, battled that knee injury for much of the season. There's even a little bit more damage than they had thought when they went in and did the surgery. They had to rehab it most of the offseason right into spring training. Casimir to Span with it on one. And Span in the air to left. Howie Kendrick settles under it and completes a 10 pitch inning for Scott Casimir. We go to the six, tied at two.
by Samsung and the Galaxy S7 Edge. And by Cialis. Back in San Francisco, and CJ, take a look at the shadows and the bright sun, the ball coming out of the pitcher's hand and then disappearing. You love this as a pitcher. It gives you a little bit of an advantage. Not much longer as those shadows will overtake the mound and get past the rubber, but you think about seeing the ball and trying to pick up spin, and it goes from being highlighted in the sun to going dark. Now, Justin Turner did not have a problem with it. Adrian Gonzalez did not have a problem in it, with it in their last at-bats. We'll see here if Derek Law can try to take advantage of it while he has it here for a little while longer. 25 year old rookie drops one outside to Jock Peterson ball one. Grandall and Kendrick to follow in this inning for the Dodgers. Peterson doubled off the wall his last time. And a couple of Dodger doubles that in many parks would have been home runs. Have Peterson's in the fourth Gonzalez in the fifth. Both off the wall in the deepest part of the yard. Here's a 2 1. And Peterson lines it right to Panic, who's playing him in short right field. Take a look at the Gatorade Frost cool under pressure moment. Go back to the fifth inning with two gone. Adrian Gonzalez hitting one of those doubles you just mentioned off of the wall and deep right center field to tie the game, bringing Turner home from first. And that's where we are now. Tied at two in the six. And when he hit that ball, he thought he was going to have an opportunity to jog around the bases. Not the case necessarily for Adrian Gonzalez, but a big hit nonetheless in a big situation. Gasmani Grandal. Takes outside one and one. We just saw Jack Peterson hit a ball on the button right into a perfectly positioned defender in Joe Panic. The Dodgers have the lowest batting average on balls in play in the majors and not just this season but since 1993 the lowest batting average on balls in play. And that tells you a lot about this offense and it's a conversation that happens now in Major League Baseball and we use that Babbitt number a lot of times to talk about luck and whether that means you're just having some bad luck and, and Dave Roberts told us today that conversation has to change. You cannot just put that on luck anymore as we see Grandal go on a call third strike that he disagrees with and he'll argue a little bit but as a catcher you always got to be a little careful mm -hmm. arguing with that home plate umpire you don't want to lose strikes later and we'll watch this one here it looks like a breaking pitch and stayed up and also off the plate and Spani Grandal has a very good argument he knows for sure that that pitch was a ball, certainly not a called third strike. You see the frustration. But getting back to that Babbitt conversation, I thought that was interesting by Dave Roberts talking about how it's now also about the shifts. It's not strictly luck. It does not mean that all of a sudden we're just going to start getting more hits and our batting average is going to go up because our Babbitt has been low. We said team shift and teams are going to continue to shift and a lot of those balls turn to outs. Kendrick the short. Crawford's got it. And the inning is over. Only 10 pitches in that inning for Derek Law. Two, three, and four coming up for the Giants in a tie game. That means Buster Posey hits third on the other side of this break.
inning but has faced the minimum since a couple of base runners but he's used a double play a caught stealing to face the minimum over the, over the last four and he'll face the heart of the order Joe panic looking at strike one Casimir in his first season in a Dodger uniform it's been quite a journey for him to get to where he is now go back to 2004 he was 20 years old when he made his major league debut for the Tampa Bay Devil Rays at the time he was an all-star in 06 he was an American League strikeout champion in 2007 all-star again in 08 pitched Tampa Bay into the World Series and things started to go downhill from there it's such an interesting story too. wondering about the New York Mets and the trade that they made leaving New York and probably uh, one of the bigger mistakes that they've made over those years in the return uh, certainly not nearly as strong as people were expecting and Scott Kazmir at the time was not looked at uh, as a guy that they thought he ended up being Victor Zambrano was the big name in that yeah. trade going to the New York Mets and so uh, that certainly was a misstep there and then you started alluding to some of the struggles that he had I ran into him in winter ball in 2011 he was pitching for Escajito down in the Dominican Republic and he did not last very long and he was struggling and did not keep him around panic into center to start the six and it looked like that was going to be the end he was trying to make that comeback at that time the next year he goes to independent ball in Sugarland Texas the numbers were not pretty and it looked like this was probably it for Scott Casimir and so the journey since then getting that opportunity with the Cleveland Indians and now here he is in Los Angeles with the Dodgers is nothing short of phenomenal and that is why you never give up in this game sometimes we see guys in winter ball and we see them in independent ball and say why is that guy still hanging around this is why you still hang around because stories like this like Scott Casimir happen every once in a while he gets Brandon Belt now with a runner at first to lead off this inning Belt is 0 for 1 walked and scored the first run back in the first and he looks at ball one. Casimir went from, you mentioned, being an all star in 2008 to two years later having the worst ERA in the American League while he was with Anaheim in 2010. They released him in 2011. You mentioned the independent ball stint in 2012. Full circle back to being an all star in 2014 when he was with Oakland. Won a career best 15 games that year. And then split last season between the A's and the Astros was dealt over at the deadline. Pitch for his hometown team for a few months. And the Dodgers signed him to the three year contract this offseason. He's been especially good in his last few starts. His 2 0 is fouled off. So I mentioned that trip to Escajito and pitching in the Dominican Winter League, which is one game, a third of an inning. I did not do well, and winter ball is such a great experience. I didn't do it until I was almost 38 years old. It's such a great experience. It's so competitive there. A lot of guys think I can go down there, maybe get some innings in, work on some things. If you're not getting it done, those teams expect to win, and they'll move on from you. It does not matter your history, your track record, what your organization wants, and that opportunity ended very quickly for Scott Casimir back in the winter of 2011. That thing disappears on Brandon Belt to even the count. Change of speeds and thinking about trying to get guys off balance. And look at this. It's like a lefty on lefty changeup, which you don't see a ton of. Brandon Belt certainly not looking for that pitch way out in front. Belt has homered against Kazmir three times in 11 at bats during his career. The 2 2. In the dirt, good stop, Grandall. Posey do next. A tough spot here for Scott Casimir, trying to work through this, trying to take advantage of the left on left, even though Brandon Belt has had a couple of good at bats and works this count now to three and two. It looks like he may try to throw another changeup. And he does, but it's ball four, and it gets by Grandall. Up to second goes Panic. Two on. Nobody out in the six for Buster Posey, who's going to face the Dodger bullpen. 
Dave Roberts motions down there. Lewis Coleman gets set to come in to face Posey. And Cowherd and Jason Whitlock do the brains to know and the guts to say catch Colin and Jason they team up for FS1's new daily sports talk show speak for yourself all starting Monday at 6 Eastern 3 p.m. Pacific tied at two in San Francisco and Lewis Coleman comes into the game to face Buster Posey first season in a Dodger uniform signed from the Royals during spring training. It has been a key piece of this Dodger bullpen. Sidearm delivery slings in a slider for strike one. Well, the idea here with nobody out, you bring in a good ground ball guy who's got a very tough angle to pick up on. Those shadows are gone now. This will be an even at bat for Buster Posey, but thinking about Coleman and what he does from that angle and trying to get a ground ball and seeing if you can get two outs on one pitch. That tails in for a strike at 91. So he's got the slider coming out of that angle and then the tailing fastball to dive in on you. 0 and 2 on Posey. It was 0 for 1 today. Walked and scored in the first. Two on, nobody out in the six. 0 2. It was the sixth inning last night when Posey came up in a 2 1 game with the Dodgers in front, hit a game tying double to score Joe Panic. Panic's the man at second right now, belts at first, and Coleman's 1 2. Slider bounced to third. Turner's got it. There's one, a juggle from Utley, and he can't pull the trigger. So they get just the out at second, and they're at the corners with one away. Well that was the plan and the plan was executed pretty well as Coleman's able to induce that ground ball from Buster Posey now unfortunately for Chase Utley could not get a clean exchange on that ball and you saw him kind of hesitate and like a good veteran does does not force that throw not with that runner going to third knowing he could throw it away and so now let's see if Coleman can do it again with an opportunity with Duffy to try to roll that double play ball. Duffy's showing some signs the last couple of days of getting that back going. Guy that finished number two in the National League Rookie of the Year voting last year to Chris Bryant. Going through a sophomore slump so far. 
There's not something you see every day, a direct throw over the third base. You can't fake anymore now, right? We used to see the first and third move. That is gone. And I don't know where they thought Buster Pose, or excuse me, where Joe Panic was going. Yeah. I don't know if they're thinking potential squeeze there. Very odd to see the throw straight to third base. Slider pulled to short. Seeger's got it. They get one. Utley throws the first wide, and the Giants take the lead. Panics into score on a fielder's choice bounce out from Duffy. Well, Coleman did it again. He got the ground ball that he wanted. Corey Seeger makes a very nice play on this ball as it's sort of an in between hop. Watch his hands here if you can from this angle. That is not as easy as it looks. So it's a good job of getting the hands out front. The throw, unfortunately, though, came in a little bit low. Look at the hands. Great job there with the throw down. Now, at this point, Chase Utley, as he loses his balance catching that throw, realizes that it's worth it to go ahead and try to turn that double play. That'll do it for Coleman. They go to J.P. Howell for the lefty-lefty matchup with Crawford. All-Star Game ballot at MLB.com slash vote. Catch all the excitement of the 87th Major League Baseball All-Star Game presented by MasterCard. July 12th live on Fox. Guy on the left, Buster Posey's been to a few of them. Guy on the right has a few of them in his future, Corey Seager. So J.P. Howell comes in for the lefty-on-lefty -lefty matchup with Brandon Crawford. Crawford 2 of 11 in his career against Howell. Giants have taken the lead in this inning. That ball kicks away from Grandall and up to second goes Duffy. Well, this great awareness here by Duffy. Always looking for that ball in the dirt. Good secondary lead. And as you see the breaking ball, which is a pretty good one, just took off a little bit on J.P. Howell. And then Grandall probably should have that ball clean, but ended up stepping on it and kicking it actually into the infield a little bit. Which is allows Duffy to go to second base. And I think that's why we saw Bruce Bochy giggling yeah, a little bit. This is time for Copa America. Here's Howells 1 0. Fouled off by Crawford 1 and 1. The Giants have made the most of the three hits they've had today. They've also taken advantage of four walks, make that five walks. Call against Scott Kazmir, who's replaced by Coleman, and then J.P. Howell. Tie-breaking run coming and a Matt Duffy fielder's choice ground out, scoring Joe Panic. It started the inning with a single.
you talked about the numbers against Howell for Brandon Crawford. Also interesting that we're seeing Howell not have a great year against lefties. This is a guy who's got good stuff, who's had a lot of good years, but this one has been a little bit off for him. And that batting average against when it comes to left-handed hitters, up over 300. We're not used to seeing that from him at all. The splits are completely backwards in 2016. So nice looking pitch. Gets Crawford two and two. Howell, a guy that coming into the season had a 197 ERA in 200 career games with the Dodgers. That was the number one ERA in LA Dodgers history for a minimum of 200 games. ERA above five this year, though. The count on Crawford is full. This will be an interesting pitch selection as you're trying to keep this game close. Just a one run game. We saw the breaking ball away on a 2 2 count. You don't want to walk Brandon Crawford necessarily, but you don't want to give him a good pitch to hit. So, got to think Howell may be thinking breaking ball again and going away and seeing if he can get Brandon Crawford to chase that pitch a little bit, but certainly does not want to give in with a runner in scoring position. And he lays off the sixth Dodger walk of the game and two on with two gone. Now the Giants have been one of the best late inning teams in baseball this year sixth worst innings one through three. But from the fourth on, the fifth best when it comes to run differential, which is a bit surprising because the bullpen has not been the typical giant bullpen. Mac Williamson takes strike one. Well, there certainly has not been, and this has been a bullpen that has been on a really nice run. Uh, going back to that first world championship of this recent group in 2010 and a lot of the same faces remain there uh, for each of those rings in 2010 12 and 14 but a little bit of a mix and not nearly the depth that Bruce Bochy has had in the past. Williamson down the right field line it's peeling foul. Tell you what off the bat you assume that that ball was automatically going to be foul but a lot closer. And I certainly thought I think some Giants fans thought that ball was still in play because it went off the wall. But here's a pitch away and that's on the corner just off the plate. Look at the head down. Very nice job by Williamson facing the lefty trying to drive it the other way. But this ball much closer to that foul line I think than than most of us thought when that ball went off the bat. Williamson hit his first career big league homer on the other night against David Price to give the Giants the win. A half inning after that home run to break a tie which was in the bottom of the eighth he made an error to lead off the top <laughs> of the ninth and put the potential tying run right back on base. Giants were able to get out of that game and hold on and make his home run the winner and he bailed out by his bullpen and that certainly looked like it was headed for a disaster because it was a pretty routine right by ball to track it down a little bit but. Ends up planking it, ends up going for essentially you know, putting a, a leadoff double or man on second base to lead off that inning, but that Giants bullpen was able to squirm their ways that squirm their way out of that. Duffy at second, two gone and a one-two. Fouled off him in the box. So this is right after he hits his first career home run, the highest of highs, right? <laughs> moments later, Casilla gets a routine fly ball, got it, got it. No, I don't have it. And he's looked a little bit uncomfortable in left field. There's a lot of ground to cover out here in San Francisco. We had talked about that and just got turned around a little bit and clanked that ball, but so happy, I'm sure, afterwards, whenever you have your pitching staff or your bullpen, anybody that helps you out after you've made a big error to keep that run from scoring. They always say this game will humble you, right? <laughs> Not often does it do it that quickly <laughs> after the kind of success he had with the home run. Another one, two. So good sequence here by Howell as you watch lefties try to work righties late in the game. 
couple of pitches away. He's now tried to finish him with the breaking ball. Has gone for the strikeout. But you get into this 2-2 count. Cannot pick anymore. You really want to think about trying to finish the at-bat with this pitch. So I'm thinking for Howell, based on how he started this at-bat, is how he wants to finish it, maybe with that fastball away. Softly hit along third. Turner charges and gets him. Justin Turner with a fantastic play to end the six. But the Giants retake the lead. It's 3-2. Late innings we go with the sun starting to go down on the Saturday matchup between the Dodgers and Giants. Strike one to Kike Hernandez. Hitting in the pitcher's spot. Against Derek Law, who skips one in there for ball one. And you have to really like the pace that you're seeing here from Derek Law. A lot of times relievers, especially close games, big situations, start to slow things down a little bit, but throwing his pitches and getting right back on the rubber. Keeping a really nice pace. It's a nice contrast to uh, Jeff Samarja, who is not exactly motoring through. <laughs> it was a little bit slower for him today, trying to find himself struggling, not nearly getting the amount of swings and misses that we're used to seeing from him. The bullpen has certainly picked that up. Laws ready to go. Hernandez ready to go for a 2 2. Look out and coming right in your living room. Got to see this view, which is a good one. That ball hits the top of the plate. Buster Posey wisely gets out of the way. No runners on base. No need to try to block that ball. And Hernandez walks to lead off the seven. Walks have been a big part of the story. Dodgers pitching has walked six. And so the Giants have these three runs despite only having three hits. Adrian Gonzalez tied the game with a double in the fifth. And it was a fielder's choice bounce out from Duffy that put the Giants back in front last half inning. Bruce Bochy coming out to make a change, letting Bill Welke know it'll be a double switch. Jared Parker comes in defensively, and they go back into the bullpen for Osich.
together on the historic Oakmont Country Club for the 116th U.S. Open Championship. Live coverage begins on FS1, continues to the final round next Sunday. That'll be on Fox. You can watch the entire tournament live on Fox Sports Go. The left-hander Josh Osich comes on to face Chase Utley. And after a really good rookie season where he had a 2.20 ERA, he earned an average two full points higher here in his second season. Ball one to Utley. Like so often, especially with left-handed relievers that are used just to get left-handed hitters out, that ERA can be a little bit misleading. That number against lefties is really what matters mostly to him. Just a 136 batting average against. So certainly some good things happening for Osich this year, despite the fact that that ERA is up a little bit. Jared Parker's in the game and left right after we showed you Mac Williamson misplaying that ball the other night. He gets subbed for. Hard hit ball that'll sneak through into center for a base hit. And Kike Hernandez first to third to put runners at the corners and nobody out in the seventh for L.A. That's a tough break for Osich. He got the ground ball that he wanted. Unfortunately, just a little bit too up the middle. Good job by Chase Utley not trying to pull that ball as that pitch was away from him. It's a routine double play if you're not shaded into the gap right there or into the hole the way that Joe Panic was, which is understandable against Utley and just out of his reach, but a great effort by Panic. So Corey Seager comes up with the tying run at third for the Dodgers and the go ahead run at first. Seager goes after the first one that sinks in there at 98 strike one. It's an incredible fastball. You look at the movement on that pitch and then see the radar gun reading at 98. That's a tough one for any hitter lefty or righty to try to square up. Doesn't add up that it moves like that <laughs> and it registers like that. Here's an 0 1. And Seeger bounces it back to the mound. They've got Hernandez hung up and get it. Osich snags the comebacker and throws the third to get Hernandez. Two ways to look at that play. You could put it on Hernandez and say bad base running, or do you put it on Osich for a great play that he made? Now, Hernandez could have been going on contact whenever you have first and third. A lot of times, you're going to send a guy on contact to try to stay out of that double play. Assuming that was going to be turned, but this is a nice play by the left. He just gets his glove on it, makes a nice throw on the run, which sometimes can be an issue. Really nice execution by the Giants. And Hunter Strickland will get the call out of the bullpen to come on and face the right-handed batting Justin Turner in a 3-2 game in the seventh. Strickland will try and keep it that way for the Giants. at Bad App, the number one app for live baseball on your phone and tablet.
Back in San Francisco. And a 3-2 game in the seventh. Dodgers had men at the corners with nobody out. Comebacker to Osich. Throws behind Hernandez at third to get him. First and second with one gone, and it's Hunter Strickland on to face Justin Turner. Turner showing signs of breaking out. Had the home run last night. He's got a double and a single so far tonight. Strickland, another guy with a big fastball. We've seen him before. Throws hard. Also, a pretty good ground ball rate at 54%. Could be a good guy to get this double play. Bottom of the zone at 97. Giants won for their last six and save opportunities. They've blown 10 saves as a team this year. Outside on Turner, one and one. The bullpen from 2010 to 2015, which includes the three championship runs, number one in baseball. Well, they were absolutely dominant. A lot of tools down there, a lot of great opportunities to mix and match with your two lefties in Affelt and Javier Lopez, Javier Lopez, who is still here. A little bit of a different feel, some new names, but still some pretty good arms. And what we're seeing right now is Bruce Bochy understanding the importance of this seventh inning and emptying these guys out right now while the Dodgers have some base runners and trying to play these matchups and hopefully being able to turn it over to guys like Corey Guerin and Casilla in the eighth and the ninth with clean innings and not necessarily with runners on base. Two on, one out in the seventh. And a 2-1 outside to Turner. On deck is Adrian Gonzalez, and Bruce Bochy would likely go to Javier Lopez down at his bullpen, which would make it four pitchers in this inning. You saw a reaction there from Strickland on that pitch as he yanked it and pulled it off the plate. Fastball command not there for him right now through these first couple of pitches. Turner the hero last night. Here in the seventh on a 3 1. He fouls it off and the count is full. I think Bo Posey might have gotten a chunk of that foul tip. Yeah, he sure did. This is a 97 mile an hour fastball. That Justin Turner looks like he just got under and fouled it. It looked like it might have caught him in the arm. It certainly mm. did right there on the bicep. And you see him wincing. That cannot feel good oh at gosh. all. Get a little flex in there, though, a little bit. Show them off. Uh huh. Tied run in second, one gone in the seventh. Interesting to see Buster Posey go out here right now and wondering what the conversation can be because we're seeing Justin Turner take some pretty comfortable swings against the Hunter Strickland fastball. He's not fooled right now. We talked about velocity. We mentioned it earlier. Some fastballs look harder than others, move more, harder to square up. I just wonder if he tried to convince him or at least ask him about an off speed pitch and how comfortable he may be throwing something else, his slider that he uses 27% of the time. He throws a lot of fastballs at 69% or potentially talking about which side of the plate they want to throw this fastball. Notley at second. Seeger at first. Turner at the plate against Strickland. Three two. In the air to deep right field. Block goes back with room to make the play. Huntley on his way to third. Two gone. And the Dodgers at the corners once again. And Dave Rigetti and Bruce Bochy at least perhaps discussing. Leaving Strickland into face Gonzalez or maybe just buying time. And he was just buying time. Javier Lopez is going to come in to face Adrian Gonzalez with a tying run at third and the go ahead run at first. One run game in the seventh in San Francisco.
out, and at least the flags be on the right center field wall saying so. Javier Lopez, a 38 year old veteran of 14 seasons, on to face Adrian Gonzalez for the tying run at third and two gone in the seventh. Strike one. Lopez has been such a staple in the San Francisco Giants bullpen. Coming from that low arm angle, you see a lot of guys try to make this conversion. He's been doing it for a long time and doing it well. So difficult for lefties to hang in there, especially the way that he comes across his body. Somehow it lays off this one, and the count evens. One ball, one strike. It's an uncomfortable bat for Adrian Gonzalez. That pitch wasn't even that close to being a strike, and the fact that he's almost offering at it tells you how difficult of a time he is having picking up that pitch. A little bit different than facing Jeff Samarja as he did in the fifth doubling off of the wall. Here's a one one that's outside and it's two on one on Gonzalez. Who's knocked in more runs than any player in the National League since he came over to the Dodgers from the Red Sox in August of 2012. Trying to buck a trend today, but the Dodgers are one for eight in these situations. Notley at third, Seeger at first, and a two-one. Downstairs, and it's three and one on Gonzalez. But Trace Thompson do next. It's been a little bit of an off year for Javier Lopez. We saw the ERA that's a little bit higher. Lefties have swung the bat pretty well against him, but he will always have that advantage because of the arm angle, even in this count. Not a bad idea at all to go right at Adrian Gonzalez. And he walked him. Wow. So the Dodgers have loaded the bases. Bruce Bochy is going to make another pitching change. The fifth pitcher of the inning coming in for the Giants. Where the base is loaded and two gone in the seventh. out of the sixth inning this is the sixth pitcher since there were two gone last inning this one is Corey Guerin inheriting a bases loaded two out jam and Guerin has done a really nice job for the Giants this year ideally I think Bruce Bochy would have handed him a clean inning to start the eighth but now he's got to get the Giants out of this jam I was wondering when Tony La Russa started playing matchups he's kind of gets credit for being one of the guys who initially started this thing if, if this is what he had in mind Using five pitchers in this inning total, correct? Five now. Well, it's got to be some kind of record. Trying to do it without allowing a run. All those changes, no damage yet. Trace Thompson 
Takes ball one, overthrown by Guerin. Utley's at third, Seeger's at second, Gonzalez at first. This inning started with a Kike Hernandez walk. He moved to third on a single from Utley, but was hung up there on a comebacker to Josh Osich for the first out of the inning. Seeger reached on a fielder's choice. Turner lined to right. Gonzalez walked. The 1 0. 2 0 on Thompson, and nowhere to put it. You see Garen as well, a little bit of a different of an arm angle guy. That fastball coming in at 93 miles an hour with really good movement on it. And not surprising, another guy that comes out of this pen with a really good ground ball rate. Whenever you start to see those different angles, a little bit lower off the top, chances are that pitcher is going to give you some more ground balls. And certainly the Giants would like to see, see a weak ground ball right now. Here's a 2 0. Down and away, not even close. Three balls and no strikes on Trace Thompson. Play certainly likes that, and this is an absolute must take for me in this situation. A lot of times, 3 0, you think about are you going to get a better pitch to hit in the at back of a base hit lead to a couple of runs? But what we've seen from Garen so far, uncomfortable fastballs. I'm sure, Thompson has to take here. Strike one. Giants with two in the first, one in the sixth. Dodgers single runs in the second and in the fifth. Utley's at third, Seeger's at second, Gonzalez at first. And a 3 1 to Trace Thompson. Outside corner three and two and that's a good pitch right there and one that Garen was trying to throw earlier in this at bat talked about the angle watch this ball come back over the plate and the movement that's on it. He walked him, and this game is tied at three in the seventh. That run is charged to Joss Osich four pitchers ago. Trace Thompson gets the RBI and the bases loaded walk. And we watch Corey Guerin come in, and he is uncomfortable right from the beginning. Watch the fastballs and how badly he is missing. And keep an eye on the mechanics here. There's that little bit of a pause. Inconsistency on the release point. It is an all fastball at bat. And then that one very smooth. This one very smooth. But watch the hesitation on this one as he yanks that ball very similar to what he did in the beginning at bat. That's an opportunity there where you have to trust your stuff. It's the base is loaded. It's a one run game. You're in a full count. Do your best to throw that ball down the middle and let whatever is going to happen happen. And it seemed like Gar Corey Guerin right there trying to make too much happen unfortunately. And he ends up walking Trace Thompson and walking in the tying run. And like Dave Roberts told us earlier today, Trace Thompson in the big spots, the expectation is that he'll succeed. His own expectation. Base is loaded still. Jock Peterson trying to put the Dodgers in front for the first time today. That cannot be understated for me. You get put in that moment, and a lot of younger hitters are going to chase something out of the zone. They're going to try to make something happen, but your ability to slow your heart rate down, not get caught up in the moment, especially on the road. Credit Trace Thompson for a tremendous at bat and staying within himself. Ball one. Nowhere to put Jock Peterson. There's one grand slam in his career. It's one thing to hope for success. It's another thing to expect it. And in the case of Trace Thompson, that's becoming more and more clear. Seeger's at third, Gonzalez at second, Thompson at first. And Guerin's 1 0 to Jock Peterson. Spins inside, two balls and no strikes. The crowd getting restless now. And understandably so. They've seen 11 walks combined in this game. We're not even through seven innings. Guys struggling to find the zone, but more importantly, struggling in big situations. 
to execute pitches to try to get this inning over with. Dangerous pitch here for Garen on 2 all. Peterson swings. It's a fly ball to center. Denard Span is there, and the inning is over. But the Dodgers tie the game on a bases loaded walk from Thompson. by missed twist insist on the twist and by Geico 15 minutes could save you 15 percent or more on car insurance that last half inning CJ lasted a half hour is that all no. five pitchers it's about six Four. minutes per pitcher right <laughs> <laughs> and it's a time I mean, that's the thing too is you have these kind of innings and you think okay blow out at some point one run came across barely right at that point and you're thinking this game's a blowout. No, it's tied 3 3 after that. Adam Libertor comes in. He's been magnificent for the Dodgers. ERA of one after starting the season in AAA Oklahoma City. Gregor Blanco, the eight hitter, leads off this inning and takes ball one. Blanco's 0 for 1. Walk in the second. One of six Giants walks drawn today. Dodgers have drawn five free passes. One and one. And there's that continued call, that fastball that is probably just off the plate, but consistency by Bill Welke in that call. You see that one a lot more often lefty on lefty than you'll see it righty on righty. It'll give you just a couple of inches off the plate. Blanco sends a fly ball to left. Howie Kendrick started the game in bright sunshine. Now the entire field almost completely in shade. One away for Jared Parker. But only the right fielder Trace Thompson has a chance to still early battle with Son. I guess Jack Peterson could move over from center to deal with it. A, a touch on a ball in the gap. Thompson's bases loaded walk that is tied the game at three. And that'll give you an idea just how bad that sun is. Sunglasses on and still using the glove. 
to try to shield it and we also saw Trace Thompson he's pretty far in that gap in right field playing over there with a left handed hitter and keeping that right line open so much that we see here at this ballpark because of that huge huge gap they have in right center. Libertor to Parker with a 1 0 and Jared Parker corks one foul three of his five hits this year have left the yard. Been up and down between Triple A and the majors with the injuries the Giants have had. Even with those injuries, 10 games above 500. First place in the West, leading the Dodgers by three games. One and two. And that'll frustrate a hitter as well. That ball was a strike, and that's a good call. But a lot of times, if a catcher drops the ball or mishandles it, does not give the umpire a good look at it, you can lose strikes that way. So credit Bill Welke for hanging in there and still making that call. Not that common. I think that's why he got a look from Parker as well. It's gently foul. It stays one and two. Giants have dropped four of five. They're four and six in their last ten games after that 15 and two run. And the Dodgers have quietly, over the last few weeks, been tied with the Cubs for the best record in the National League. 12 and six over the last almost three weeks. Now within three games. Have not been within two games of the Giants since May 17th. Here comes a one two and Parker lifts a fly ball to center. Jack Peterson out number two. In the case of the Dodgers it has been an up and down season pretty much right from the start couldn't have gotten off to a better start. They shut out the Padres over three games and a sweep to begin the season. Then came up here and lost three of four and they've kind of gone back and forth between winning streaks and skids. Roller coaster season and Dave Roberts. First year as the skipper. That hard span. All one. And a lot of times when you see that from teams because they have maybe the high strikeout offense the high home runs swings and misses where those offenses can go hot and cold but that's not necessarily the case of the Los Angeles Dodgers. They've had to deal with some injuries. They've had to deal with some inconsistencies and lack of performance from certain players. But they don't necessarily have that roster when you look at it that says this is a team that could be going through a lot of hot and cold streaks. Well, there it is. That eight and three run after the Giants took three of four from them, and then lost six in a row. Then an eight and four stretch. Then before this current stretch, which is tied for the Cubs as the best run in baseball or in the National League right now they lost six of seven and this current run began with a 17 inning win against San Diego and so often a team wins a game like that and the cliche is maybe it can spark them <laughs> in this case it actually did it seems like well, those are battles that can wear you out certainly you rely so heavily on your bullpen that thing gets emptied out as well and you battle that long you want to win those games you're going to put that much time in and it's good to see you for the Dodgers and their fans that that's something that was able to kick off one of those hotter streaks. Three fly balls in this inning Peterson again and after a half an hour half inning we're rewarded with a six minute <laughs> half inning after seven locked at three.
bottom third of the Dodger order as we start the eighth inning in San Francisco. Corey Guerin to Yasmani Grandal with strike one. Grandal is two for or one for two today. RBI single in the second. Walked in the fourth and then struck out in the sixth. Dodger catcher last season hit 295 before he hurt his shoulder. He was an all star for the first time, but then took a foul tip off his shoulder in early August and finished the year on a 6 for 94 stretch. And it brought the numbers way down for the final line. I thought it was interesting talking to Dave Roberts before the game. We talk about catchers and when they struggle offensively. What does that do for them defensively right they're such a vital part of the game and if things are going bad with the bat sometimes guys will take those at bats out into the field. Dave Roberts said absolutely not which is with the Asmani Grandal he said earlier in his career when he was with him in San Diego yes he would see that sometimes but right now it has been a non issue. On one and two Grandal bounces it foul. And it's been a similar thing this season where Grandal got off to a hot start and then has struggled he was hitting. Around 290 in early May, but over the last month, is he's again dealt with some nagging injuries. In this case, a bruised wrist that averaged down around 120 over the last month. One of the many pieces the Dodgers are hoping can return to their career norms. Another one, too. Osmani Grandal leading off this eighth inning for the Dodgers. And battling against Guerin. Two teams find themselves in another close game, locked at three in the eighth. And when you look at the stats for these two squads, as far as pitching and defense and hitting, they're pretty similar as far as league rankings. So why have the Giants been three games better? This has a large part to do with it. The Giants are the third best team in the majors. In one run games, while the Dodgers are below 500 in one run games. Of course, last night, Dodgers were able to take a one run victory from the Giants on a ninth inning home run from Justin Turner. A lot of that comes down to your bullpen, of course, obviously, late. Can they hold that lead? But also the clutch hitting, doing all the little things right, moving runners over, executing a bunt when you need to. The Giants have been very good in that regard so far this year. Garrett to Grandall with a 3 2 and a strikeout to begin the eighth. Corey Garren playing with a little bit of fire here on that full count. We saw him struggle last inning with command 3 2, a little bit further off the plate than you probably want as you see that pitch. Finishing a ball, but Grandal getting a little bit aggressive, trying to make something happen here to start off the eighth inning. I'll tell you, Corey Guerin will tell you, certainly would like to get ahead of some of these hitters. He's put himself in some pretty tough counts so far since he's been in this game. It was the fifth pitcher brought into that last half inning by Bruce Bochy. They gave up only one run, came in a bases loaded walk from Trace Thompson to tie the game at three. And in unloading the bullpen the way that he did to make sure that he limited the damage there. This thing stays tied for too long. Giants are going to be looking at some problems down there. Santiago Casilla, Chris Stratton, the only guys remaining in the Giants bullpen. No, absolutely. And Corey Guerin, if this thing does stay tied and can keep his pitch count down, may be asked to even take it beyond this inning. But you're absolutely right. Now, this bullpen had been well rested, but. They start to run out of bodies after using five guys in that sixth and seventh inning. Excuse me. Well, Guerin's lost his command again. He's been so good this year, but you're going to have those days once in a while, especially coming out of the bullpen when you have to be ready essentially 
almost 162 times a year plus the postseason. There are going to be days where you're going to struggle with command. You're going to struggle with release point consistency. Today's been that day for Corey Guerin right now, but still an opportunity to keep his team in this game. Well, they're going to need him. We talk about the remaining pieces for the Giants and Casilla and Stratton. Longest outing this year for Casilla, one and a third. Longest outing for Stratton, one inning. Get all they can get from Guerin, who's ready for a 3 1 to Howie Kendrick. Howie Kendrick, former Angel, with AJ Ellis, do next. 32 years old, his 11th big league season, so consistent throughout his career. And a tie game in the eighth with the bases empty and one gone. A 3 2. Very similar swing that we see there from Howie Kendrick that we saw from him earlier in the game against Jeff Samarja, where it's a fastball with a lot of movement on it up in the zone, but he keeps it level and ends up lining it. To the right side. He's trying. Anytime you face a good sinker ball, you're trying to get him up in the zone to give you your best opportunity. He's done a good job of fighting those pitches off today. Comes another payoff from Corey Guerin. And he's walked Kendrick. So the go ahead run reaches for the Dodgers with one gone in the eighth. And A.J. Ellis comes up to pinch hit out of the nine spot for the Dodgers. Typically Clayton Kershaw's personal catcher, although last night it was Yasmani Grandal that did the catching for Kershaw. So Ellis well rested. What we've seen from Corey Guerin so far is so atypical of what he has done this year. The walk rate 1.7 per nine innings. I mean that is a beyond elite level. One of the best relievers in Major League Baseball this year puts him at 14th for anybody that's thrown at least 20 games. That is a big big number a good number and just not the guy that we're seeing so far today. Ellis on the ground is short Crawford to panic to belt to the bottom of the eighth tied at three.
by Samsung and the Galaxy S7 Edge and by Bud Light. Raise one to right now. Maybe a Bud Light or two being raised out there. <laughs> Hopefully not for those kayakers. No, all right. Some good parties going on in those boats. We've had some shots that we've seen from great view we have here in San Francisco. Joe Blanton comes in. He has resurrected his career out of the bullpen, a converted starter. He's been one of the Dodgers' best offseason pickups. Absolutely, you see the numbers there. Bring him in on a one-year deal for $4 million, and not just found a home in the bullpen, but has been impact. Rolled up along first. Gonzalez hoping it stays fair, and it does, to get panic on one pitch. Well, I'm sure Bruce Bochy is going to take a look at this, or at least his guys are upstairs. As you see this ball go right down the line, good play by Adrian Gonzalez. This ball would have gone foul, but he makes sure that he gets it before it does. And Joe Panic smart to run right out of the box. But you see it going there and just catches it on the outside of the line. I'll tell you what, that was really, really close. But it appears that the Giants did not see anything on their end that would convince them that it would be worth it to challenge that play. Brandon Belt has walked twice more today. Now has two more walks than strikeouts this year. Let's see. You know what? I actually believe, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Joe. Now, first of all, let's see, that's foul. But they cannot challenge it if it is in front of first base. Exactly. So that's actually not a play that can be challenged. I apologize for stating that the wrong way. That ball has to, any, any fat, fair or foul ball has to be past the bag in order for them to challenge it and so the Los Angeles Dodgers catch a pretty big break which is where it becomes the jurisdiction of the base umpires. So that one's on Bill Welke because uh -huh. the first base umpire right there is not going to be able to see that ball with Adrian Gonzalez blocking him. So that's Bill Welke's call. Look at a nice view over here. Still fair still fair. Oh I tell you what from that angle that's a little bit of a tougher call. But yeah. We saw the other one. That told us that it was probably foul, but a very difficult call to make regardless. Plans falling behind Belt 2 and 1. One gone in a tie game in the eighth inning. Dodgers and Giants at it again. Belt hits a pop up. Foul ground. Long run for Seeger because of the shift, and he's under it awkwardly. <laughs> Good thing to see a smile on his face. <laughs> Away. Well, that's certainly one of the things that the shift has brought us, which is seeing position players in positions that they're usually not in, right? That is a routine pop-up to a third baseman, but the third baseman, Justin Turner, was over at second base, as you can see him at the top of your screen. So this is all on Corey Seager to cover a decent amount of that left side. Legs got a little tired at the end, and genuflex as he catches yeah, that ball. He gave out on him. Buster Posey. Who has owned Joe Blanton during his career? He's nine for 19 with a home run. Awkward swing and a miss on a slider, strike one. It's a good slider there, and you see Buster Posey talking to himself, obviously not picking up the rotation on that pitch and kicking himself a little bit, or guessing there and thinking fastball and getting fooled. It's that slider that he got the swing and miss on that helped him reinvent himself as the reliever. Threw it about 15% of the time when he was a starting pitcher. More than 30% of the time as a reliever last year, when by some metrics it was the most effective slider in the majors. One and two. Well, it's amazing to think it is not an automatic just because you were a starting pitcher that you can slide into the bullpen and become an impact arm and it takes a while the adjustment period is there for a lot of guys and it's not like Joe Blanton is dealing with Tansis with a great fastball or any of these other guys it's an average fastball but it's finding that slider finding that off speed pitch that can make a difference that get that gets guys off of that fastball and then with good location he becomes a really solid two pitch pitcher. Dodgers started this game with a guy in Scott Casimir who had to go to independent baseball to get his career restarted. Joe Blanton had retired in 2014 before coming back. And it's 2 2 to Buster Posey. I think that also just speaks to the need for pitching experience. Pitching, yes, we're in a pitching generation right now. We've seen 
this game be pitched in a way that we have not seen before. The strikeout rates, the velocities that we see, but there is always that need, especially for bullpen arms. And how cool for Joe Blanton. Retire and come out and get yourself a $4 million a year job. Now, ready for another 2 2, and Posey had a hanging slider that he jams foul. This has not been the same Buster Posey here in 2016. Hitting only 256 coming into the game. Three time All Star, former MVP. Just one year ago, his average was 318. You figure that the average will continue to tick up in that direction as this year rolls on. And you see the velocities there, and you say, well, how could Buster Posey be late on a 91 mile an hour fastball that looks to pe appears to be right down the middle ball, comes back a little bit, outer third, outer half, keeps his head down, but that is the value of the slider. You talk about the breaking pitch, he also has the curveball. That keeps good hitters off of that fastball. It's not about that velocity, but how he has gotten there and sets, sets that pitch up. Ninth pitch of this at bat from Joe Blanton to Buster Posey. His bounce foul. Quite a battle we've got going between Blanton and Posey with the bases empty and two gone and a tie game in the eighth. And you know Buster Posey does his homework and he thinks about these at bats and what's going to happen. Joe Blanton throws that fastball just 30 percent of the time. That is one of the lowest amongst relievers in Major League Baseball. And I think that's what happens. He gets that slider and curveball in the back of his head. And so the 11th pitch coming to Buster Posey. Slide the club record extension a couple of years ago. He's under control through 2022. Face of this franchise. So many big moments as a giant. Trying to add another one against their biggest rival. And I thought it was pretty interesting. Bruce Bochy talking about managers and could he manage? He said, absolutely. I just don't know if he'd be motivated to with all the success he's had on the field already. Line to Seeger and the inning is over. An 11 pitch at bat ends with a line out. We go to the ninth, locked at three.
second night in a row. Dodgers and Giants have played into the ninth tied. Second night in a row, Santiago Casilla has entered that situation. He's not been the same guy this year. Four blown saves, two losses. For a guy that's been one of the top back end relievers in the game over the last half decade or so. Top of the order for the Dodgers, it's Otley, Seeger, and Turner. And Otley takes strike one. A lot of people in San Francisco and fans around the area are asking. Should Casilla be removed from that closer's job and for Bruce Bochy that answer is absolutely no. Yes he has struggled in a couple of big situations and it's hurt the team but the stuff is still there. They also don't necessarily have the options that they have had in the past. They've made changes in championship seasons in the middle of the season as far as who they're going to have close games but Casilla right now probably still the best option you've seen almost all of this bullpen today and, and one of the interesting facts is that some of his numbers are actually up this year. The strikeouts per nine are at a career high. The velocity is still really good. Striking out better than 11 batters per nine innings. He's never had a number higher than 10. So still some good things going on for Casilla. This is outside with ball one to Otley. The Giants would love to get Sergio Romo back, who's been on the disabled list with a forearm strain most of the season. He's on his way back right now. Could be within the next couple of weeks. And like you mentioned they have made a change before more than once between Casilla and Romo and vice versa. And when they do that too which is always so amazing is that there's never any drama surrounding it. They've created a really nice culture here where the guys are legitimately all pulling from the same rope and that team first attitude absolutely exists here where we've seen it with other teams. The guy gets removed from the closure ball. Maybe he pouts about it. Maybe he struggles and he pitches poorly and then he gets moved on from the organization but you have not seen that here from the San Francisco Giants and a lot of that credit goes to what Dave, what Dave Rigetti and Bruce Bochy have created. Here. Two and two on Chase Utley. Yeah, reporters started to ask Bruce Bochy last night about Casilla and any changes that might be coming and Bochy before the reporter even finished the question said that Casilla right now is our closer. Vote of confidence is so important for a player when he's going through some struggles, knowing that your manager is stepping up for you and not even allowing that door to deal. Comes a 2 2, and Utley strikes out to begin the night. Well, I mentioned it, the strikeout rate is up for Casilla. The velocity is still good. This is 94 miles an hour with great movement and that is by Chase Utley no chance at catching up to that pitch. So Corey Seager now who is 0 for 4. You know, 1 for 8 in this series. 14 home runs to lead the club but a well placed fastball taken for a strike. 12 of those 14 homers have come since the first week of May which is tied for the major league lead during that stretch. I think everybody thought that he would hit. I'm not sure anybody thought he'd hit for this kind of power this quickly. I'll tell you this you watch these guys on TV all day long and generally Major League Baseball players are not super sized human beings the way they are in the NFL and certainly the NBA but Corey Seager in person a lot bigger I think than people realize. First time for me to see him in person doing this game and it's unbelievable when you see his size knowing that he plays a position that requires so much agility. Enticing pitch but he lays off ball on. Not only is it hard in velocity but the Corey Seager check swing the Chase Utley swing and miss to finish his at bat tells you how late the life is on that fastball you see movement. Not all movement is created equal. Some of it can be loose and it can be sloppy. But in the case of Casilla right now, he is getting late, late, tight movement on that two-seam fastball. Seager with an opposite field base hit. Over to cut it off is Parker holding him to a single. With one gone here in the ninth. Credit this young man and what he is doing right now. This is a backdoor cutter that Casilla tries to throw and catch the outside part of the plate. It's on the corner. Now it's up just a little bit. But look at Seeger with the two strike approach, head down on the ball. And with that shift, that is going to be a base hit every time. And even thinking, too, the aggressive turn around first base. You love seeing that as well. And 
If there was even the slightest bobble in left, he would have taken that base. So Justin Turner, who just last night homered against Casilla to win the game for the Dodgers. Same matchup, same spot. Bouncing ball to short, different result. 6 4 3. Casilla gets the job done. Onto the bottom of the ninth, locked at three. Five walk-off wins this season. If they're going to win this one, they'll add to that total. Dodger fan on the right, Giant fan on the left, and they're sticking through this game that is now running about three and a half hours and still no decision. It's been a little bit of a long game, but it has been a good game, certainly when you see a tie going here into the bottom of the ninth against two teams that should be battling for this division. Throughout this 2016 season, this is Giants Dodgers. This is what these fans like. And Duffy bounces the first offering from Joe Blanton to Chase Utley for round number one. So the Giants now going back. Let's see, if you want to count this as a full game, their last 11 games as a team are hitting 186. They don't have a hit today since the first inning, or one hit today since the first inning. Only three hits total. And certainly part of the problem here in San Francisco, and I say problem, yes, they're a first place team, but something that they cannot sustain. There is no way they'll be able to continue to hit at that clip and win baseball games, and it's not going to happen. This team has a lot of good hitters. There's some good track records here, but you go through those slumps, but the upside is when you go through them and you're still holding on to first place, you can be optimistic. What happens when you start to play bad, similar to what the Royals are doing right now, and you're not hitting, and you're not doing a lot of things right, you fall out of first place and fall behind a couple of teams. That's when you start to push that panic button, but the Dodgers, excuse me, the Giants right now have the luxury of still being in first place. Yeah, neither one of these teams has hit, yet here they are, both the top of the division. Blanton's falling behind Crawford, 2-0. Crawford, one of the great clutch hitters in the game over the last couple of seasons. On 2 and 0. Oh. He takes it in the dirt, ball three. You go back to one of the first days of the season against Joe Blanton. An opposite field walk off home run, the first of five walk off wins for the Giants so far this year. That was on the night that Ross Stripling, the Dodger rookie pitcher, in his debut took a no-hitter into the eighth before he was removed with that no-hitter intact. Three and one. And Joe Blanton, you never forget those moments. When you give up the big ones, especially again with these two teams, they always seem a little bit bigger. They always seem bigger when they're within your division. And so certainly for Blanton being a little bit more careful here, 
of Brandon Crawford and not wanting to repeat that mistake from April. After a long pause, a 3 1, and Crawford swings and misses 3 and 2. You saw Grandal put down those four fingers he wanted, or Joe Blanton did because he shook to it, wanted the 3 1 changeup. This is what a veteran pitcher does in a fastball count, take an aggressive hitter. That is a nasty, nasty huh. changeup. Now it's a ball if he takes it, but it was so good. We have Brandon Crawford way out front. And the question becomes now, will he throw it again? And I believe that answer will be yes. But watch Grandal, watch the fingers that he puts down. I bet you he starts with the changeup. Look at us up here stealing signs. He did, and Crawford took it. And that one looks like a slider. I think that was a slider because yeah. it looked like the three that was there, but it just speaks to how Joe Blanton was looking at Brandon Crawford, which is I'm not going to give this guy a fastball and give him that opportunity. And there it is, absolutely a breaking ball. As you see the spin, you see the dot, and the ball goes down just below the zone. 3 2 count, potential winning run. You're thinking you want to throw that ball down the middle, especially an off speed pitch on a 3 2 count. And so Connor Gillespie will bat. 171 average and limited ABs for the Giants this year. Remember the Giants burned through most of that bullpen during the seventh inning using five different pitchers have also burned all but one bench piece and it's their second catcher Trevor Brown so you'd hate to use him unless you had to. You don't want to go into a long game without a true backup catcher for Buster Posey. One pitcher remaining, Chris Stratton, who is down in the bullpen warming up, so he is coming into this game. If it goes extra innings and if it goes deep into extra innings, he's going to find out just what kind of stamina he really has. It's a tough position to be in. Nobody else down in that bullpen. If the Giants don't win it here, they're going to try to ride Chris Stratton as long as they can. Winning run at first in the form of Crawford and a one on one count on Gillespie. Outfield plays very deep, not wanting a ball to get through that would allow Crawford to score from first. And I was just thinking as we see this shot of the crowd, it's been a longer game, but great opportunity here for a walk off. These fans stick around, they want to see this. This is such a tremendous fan base, and they're looking for that moment to get loud as hopefully the winning run comes across the plate. And a towering fly ball hit to right, but he just got under it. Trace Thompson has out number two. <laughs> he almost teed it up, and he just barely missed it. The wrong ballpark on the wrong day. And you see Connor right here. His fastball's right down the middle. A good pitch to hit. Just got under it a little bit and kind of hoping he knew it, though. Put his head down. He knew he just missed that pitch. A good throw by Trace Thompson as we saw Brandon Crawford actually thought about maybe tagging up and why not thinking about with two outs trying to get into scoring position but certainly you don't want to run into that out at second base. Remember one of the Dodgers three runs today came thanks to Trace Thompson doing exactly that tagging from first going to second scoring on a single. Gregor Blanco with a man at first and two gone. Tie game in the last of the night. Strike one. And then on the flip side, what we saw from Enrique Hernandez at third base when he got cut off when the ground ball went back to Osich, the pitcher, it was a first and third situation. That probably could have changed uh, the way this game had gone. And so the base running, always in these close games, a very important part. And a lot of times we can pick out one incident that changed the game. Teams will play one more in this series tomorrow. Julio Urias, 19 year old rookie for the Dodgers, goes against Jake Peavy, who was 19 and highly touted at one point. <laughs> <laughs> a 
And that'll certainly be a fun one as we've seen kind of Arias come up with a lot of fanfare, and I think everyone just kind of expected the world. It's pretty unfair, especially yeah. for a 19-year-old kid, but you can see it. You can see the stuff. The fastball is live. The breaking ball is sharp. And he was not meant to be Fernando Valenzuela just yet, but certainly it seems like a good career is in store. 0 oh, 1 from Blanton. Nothing in two on a fastball to 91. For the Dodgers, if this gets to the 10th, they'll have the middle third of the order due up. Gonzalez, Thompson, and Peterson. Three guys that can hit it out of the ballpark. Blanco trying to snap an 0 for 19 slide and trying to end this game for the Giants. Blanton's 0 2. Finishes him off and sends us. Oh, they're going to say that it was a foul ball and it hit the ground before it went into Grandall's mitt. So it sends us to another pitch here in the night. Well, interesting. This is not an easy call to make for the home plate umpire. I watched it live and I thought Grandall caught this ball. Let's see it here. Oh, it's a great call in yep. the dirt. Nice job. As much as I tell you what, man, I'm sitting there watching this thing live with a better view. And I thought in real time he caught that ball clean. That's a great job by home plate umpire Bill Welke. Crawford at first and a tie game, two gone in the ninth. You see Joe Blanton right there look back and shake his head yes. And the reason is is because Grandal put down the changeup, but he stepped off, but he confirmed yes, that is the pitch. I believe that he wants to throw here, probably just off the plate. Got good fade to it and got a ground ball to Chase Utley, who goes the short way. And now we go to the tenth inning. Dodgers and Giants tied at three. Extra baseball in San Francisco. and Giants tied at three. Joe Davis, C.J. Nikowski back at AT&T Park. And Chris Stratton heads to the mound for the Giants. Third appearance for him. Third appearance of his career and certainly an interesting place to be. At least you are at home, not worried necessarily about the walk-off, but your team needs you now. As that bullpen has been pretty much emptied out, Chris Stratton's going to be asked to go through the middle of this Los Angeles Dodgers lineup. 
Now one note an important one if this game keeps going that we fail to acknowledge is that because Matt Kane will be activated off of the DL as Gonzalez hits a fly ball to deep left field sending Parker back at the wall and it's gone. Adrian Gonzalez has put the Dodgers in front with a 10th inning home run. What a nice at bat by Adrian Gonzalez to drive that ball out to left field for a left handed hitter. Not an easy thing to do here in San Francisco when he does it on the second pitch of this at bat. Stratton is not pitching nine days. Certainly a tough spot to be in for him. Adrian Gonzalez aware of that. See something out over the plate. Not a terrible pitch. But again, as we see these guys go the other way, look at the head down driving the ball. And it did just squeak out. But I said it before, there is no such thing as a cheap home run here in San Francisco. What we were in the middle of saying was that Albert Suarez would be available for the Giants today because Matt Cain is ready to be activated to join the rotation. That will again make Suarez a long man. Trace Thompson strokes a line drive base hit into center. Take a look at the stat cast breakdown of that Gonzalez home run brought to you by Amazon Web Services. And we see this ball got up there a little bit. Launch angle 30 degrees. 365 feet not an impressive number but that is an impressive home run exit velocity 96 miles an hour and if you're saying well we've seen it in the hundreds before you're going opposite field and hitting a lofty fly ball you're certainly not going to see the exit velo that you see on line drives or pulled home runs and Adrian Gonzalez doesn't care about any of it what he cares about and what his teammates care about is the fact that that was a home run and has put his team up here in the 10th inning. And so the Dodgers if they can lock this thing down in the bottom of the 10th will be looking at back to back nights of winning the game with a solo home run in the top of the final inning that just barely cleared the left field wall. Justin Turner last night. Adrian Gonzalez tonight. Dave Rigetti out there trying to calm his rookies nerves because it's only one run so far and it's still important for him for Chris Stratton to try to keep this game close. Don't let this inning get out of hand and give his team at least an opportunity to try to score in the bottom of the 10th inning. Dodgers trying to get back to within two games of the Giants for the first time since May 17th. Chuck Peterson was shouting down at Chris Woodward third base coach wanting him to cycle through the signs again and Woodward didn't hear him so Jock <laughs> got back in the box and take a ball. He asked for the signs again as you see them I'm curious here if he's even thinking that potentially a bunt is on the table. I can't imagine that it is unless he's worried about a steal sign if he wants to take that pitch in his counter or, or maybe a hit and run but I got to think right now. As you take the lead and you see a young rookie struggling that you want Jock Peterson swinging away. Overshift on the left handed batter. He's one for four today with a double off of the wall. And shoots one to the other way. It's Parker coming on, laying out, and making the catch. Jared Parker with a nice play. Back to first goes Thompson. Very nice play. He was playing a little bit deep with the left handed Peterson up, not wanting anything to get over his head. But it's full speed ahead and a good dive and good awareness to get up and seeing if there was an opportunity potentially to double up Trace Thompson but Thompson a very good base runner sees that ball is caught and gets back to first in plenty of time or to make sure Thompson doesn't try to take <laughs> second on him like he did earlier. Good point. Uh, not on Parker but on a deep fly ball to left center earlier in the game. That's Monty Grandall. Reached his first two times up tonight single and a walk he struck out his last two trips. There's really no such thing as a bad job in Major League Baseball but 
Two of the toughest jobs, the most difficult to perform in, are being a pinch hitter, coming in cold, not being in the flow of the game, and being asked to, to perform in a big situation. The other one is the long man in the bullpen. And people probably don't put much thought into it, don't think about it very much. You're the last man down there, and there are a lot of big gaps a lot of times in between your outings. And that's certainly the case for Chris Stratton. Has not pitched since June 2nd. This is just his third big league game. It's very difficult to stay sharp when you come out of the bullpen and you're not getting regular work. And a lot of times you're either put in situations like this where it's extra innings and it becomes really important, or you're asked sometimes to eat some innings because your starter got knocked out early and they may need you to throw three or four innings. It is a very difficult job and not trying to make excuses for Chris Stratton, but certainly not an easy thing to do. Meanwhile, it was almost a foul ball splash hit. Wound up getting down there, but off the bounce and the race is on. Oh, you get it. I hope that guy doesn't have a Dodger gray shirt on, because there's a good chance that kayak gets turned over. He's got the ball. <laughs> Enemy waters. Bottom of the zone for strike three. Grandall has not been happy with the strike zone of Bill Welke today. Third time that he's been punched out, two away. Well, he was right about his last at bat, but not this one. This one here is certainly a strike. That's a breaking ball, comes back and catches the outer third of the plate. Buster Posey brought that ball up a little bit, but the ball was not down. That is a strike all the way. Now, in the previous at bat, I think absolutely he had a case to be made for a strike that was called a ball. Excuse me, a ball that was called a strike. Yeah, I knew what you meant. <laughs> Here's Howie Kendrick. Kendrick loops a fly ball to right center on the run is Blanco the inning comes to a close Adrian Gonzalez with an opposite field home run to put the Dodgers in front 4-3 and Kenley Jansen gets ready to come in to try and close it out for the Dodgers. On to try and close it out for the Dodgers up 4 3 after the home run from Adrian Gonzalez. Jansen looking for his 160th save in a Dodger uniform, which will put him one short of Eric Gagne's club record. Jared Parker taking ball one. Kenley Jansen quietly has been one of the most dominant closers in Major League Baseball, and he does it. 
throwing predominantly cutters. He is a lot of fun to watch, generates a lot of swings and misses, and he will be highly coveted this offense, excuse me, this offseason if the Dodgers let him get the free agents. He came on last night and retired the first two that he faced, but then gave up a double to belt. He walked Blanco. And the Giants put together quite a threat against him before he was able to slam the door. Two and one. And conversation always starts with Araldus Chapman, Dylan Batances, Andrew Miller, the three guys in New York, Craig Kimbrell as well, as some of the best relievers we have. Kenley Jansen since 2014 has the fifth best strikeout per nine rate. But he's also got the best walk rate, better than those guys. So he's right there with them with strikeouts, but he actually does a better job of keeping the ball in the strike zone than any of them and not walking. Parker pops it up on the left side of the infield. It's Justin Turner. And so coming into this series, the Giants were 13 and 6 in one run games. And in extra innings, Dodgers 4 and 2 this year, Giants 4 and 4. But coming into this series, they were 13 and 6 in one run games and are in danger of dropping one run games on back to back nights. Top of the order now, it's Denard Span. Span two home runs this season. Joe Panic will follow. Jansen's 1 0. Base hit down the right field line. The Giants have the tying man in scoring position. It kicks away. Turner runs it down. Jansen covers third, and Span holds it second. An impressive piece of hitting by Denard Span in a situation against, as I mentioned, one of the toughest relievers in Major League Baseball. Gets an opportunity, gets the barrel out in front of that cutter, hits it into the corner. And I'm watching this play unfold, and we have this great view from up here. And you can see that throw was going to be a short hop. And Justin Turner not backing that up originally. It's a great job by Kenley Jansen. If he is not covering third base, you have Denard Span standing at third with one out as the potential tying run. And now certainly in a great spot in scoring position. As the Giants get to go now through the middle of their order and they bring up a couple of lefties which you certainly like against Jensen. Second night in a row the Giants have put the tying run in scoring position against Jansen. Panic now belt due next. And a 4 3 game in the 10th. Kenley wants Grandall to come out to get on the same page. Absolutely. You want no confusion at this point. It becomes about making sure that you have your signs right, what you want to use with the runner on second base, and with Kenley Jansen just confirming that, and then maybe also wanting to talk just a little bit of strategy, being on the same page. So critical in situations like this. Any doubt at all, you absolutely call timeout, bring your catcher out there, make sure you get things cleared up. Steve Kerr still in the house. Do you have a game to prepare for? It'll take like five days in between games. It'll it take playoffs, a while. Tying run in second in the tenth inning and a 1 0. Panic fouls it off. One ball, one strike. 
cutter that Jansen throws is it's really so amazing because he does not lose a lot of velocity and the comparisons are hard to make. You don't see very many cutter heavy closers. Mariano Rivera of course the best that we've ever seen of any kind of closer but similar at least in that sense where just about everything they're throwing has hard cut to it which actually makes it very tough on those lefties which makes the span hit even more impressive. Line towards left center field. It's down. Here comes Span. Panic has tied the game. Well, Steve Kerr certainly enjoying this moment and enjoying this game, but here is a pitch away. Not a lot of cut to it. Joe Panic with a perfect approach. That ball is up and away. Big gaps here in San Francisco. He plugs one up with that ball right there. Driving home the tying run, and this is something we just do not see from Kenley Jansen very often. Three batters face so far. We have not seen a strikeout. I don't think we've seen a swing and miss yet. Kenley Jansen not on his game right now. And it's Brandon Belt now with a winning run on base for San Francisco. Jansen was not his usually dominant self last night either. Was able to wiggle out of that with a win intact to pick up another save. Not the case in this one as Panic drives in Span to tie the game at four. You almost wonder a little bit with Kenley Jansen because of that hit by Denard Span, which should cut her more middle in. We see him working these guys away. If he's gotten a little bit tentative throwing that ball in, which you cannot as a closer. And think about, again, where's the best place to hit a home run here? It's going to be down the right field line and maybe not wanting to give any of these left-handed hitters an opportunity to pull the ball. Seven home runs this season. Panic at first, decent speed. Shows bunt, takes ball one. With that overshift <laughs> on. What do you wow. think? Interesting. I don't love it. Kenley Jansen's difficult enough to hit against and trying to bunt. And remember, Brandon Belt had that issue. We talked to Hensley Mullins before the game about it, where he's not a great bunter. And he says, Yeah, they put that shift on, but if you're not a great bunter, we're not going to ask you to come to the big leagues and learn how to bunt. And he actually took that ball off the thumb. I can't remember who he was facing, but he tried to bunt. And hit, and the ball actually ended up hitting his thumb. And the Giants certainly cannot afford to lose him. Here's a 1 1, and Belt swings, lifts one to right. Thompson started back, comes on, and lets it fall in for a base hit. Tried to deep the runner to get him headed back to first. Panic wasn't fooled. Two on with one out. Well, you and I talked about it earlier today. We talked about things like route efficiency. Well, what happens when Brandon Belt takes a big swing and it looks like he may have squared the ball up, but he didn't. He got jammed, and so we watched Joe Panic, and he's got to watch Thompson. Thompson went back first and then kind of gave that fake with the idea of maybe tricking Joe Panic. Watch this here. Watch Trace Thompson go back and then realize this ball was not hit hard at all. He throws his glove up to maybe get Joe Panic to go back to first base and really just a tough break right there for the Dodgers. Yeah that big swing gives the illusion and we've also started to reach that time of night where it can be hard to pick the ball up. It's at that level that loft sometimes gets lost in the early stages of the lights. Buster Posey steps in with a winning run at second and one gone in the tenth. Buster Posey coming out hacking. We've seen some frustration from him today. His last at bat frustrated with how it ended. That line out the short squared that ball up and what a great moment this would be for him right now if he could end this game has not been the typical Buster Posey season that we're used to seeing from him but big hits at this point in the game are all that matter. Jansen's 0 1. 
Posey hits a base hit in the center. The Giants score two in the tenth to win it 5-4. A good moment here for Buster Posey. We've seen Kenley Jansen struggle all day today. That stuff was not there. The cutter was not nearly as good. This one over the middle. And Posey hits it just hard enough to get it up the middle. Another foot to the left, and that's probably a double play ball that ends the inning. But he gets enough on it, and it's been a little bit of a frustrating day for Buster Posey. His at-bats, he showed some of that frustration. This is a guy that does not show very much emotion. And so a nice moment for him and for Steve Kerr hanging in there for 10 innings. A true Giant fan. And so Posey, the hero in the 10th after Gonzalez homer to put the Dodgers in front in the top of the inning. The Giants get two in the bottom half. But CJ Nikowski and the rest of our crew, Joe Davis, Jenny to the break. Studios got it on the other side.